Ja mislim da je, da je ovaj, vreme da počne malo par minuta gore dole. Dobar dan, još odared. Good morning. I wish you all a warm welcome and I thank you for your presence. This is a traditional judicial forum organized with great assistance and support of the Erie Center from London and the UK Embassy. Yet again, we've been able to organize it despite the pandemic. The Constitutional Court thanks in particular our dear colleagues, presidents of the highest courts who came here to be with us and to speak with us. I thank the media who are here today. And in particular, our dear friends from the media who will also be panelists in the second part of this event, because I'll be one of the moderators throughout the day and you will have heard enough of me. I won't take long in my introduction. So once again, thank you for coming and I'll now invite Ms. Biljana Brightwhite. She is the director of the Erie Center for Western Balkans. Good morning. The presidents, excellencies, judges, media representatives, it's a pleasure to welcome you all, all of you here in this room and all of you who are with us online, on behalf of the Air Center to the fourth annual Judicial Forum for Bosnia and Herzegovina. We've had the privilege of being one of the founders of the Judicial Forum, and we're happy to organize this event, as the president said, despite the delays caused by the COVID crisis. The forum is an important part of our program implemented in collaboration with the Constitutional Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, the highest courts of ordinary jurisdiction and uh, judicial training centers focused on harmonizing jurisprudence with, first of all, the European Court of Human Rights, but also harmonizing jurisprudence of lower courts with higher courts. The transparency of judiciary is an important topic. All the systems across Europe are facing issues of balancing private and public interest, how to make institutions more open and more accessible to the citizens, thus contributing to confidence of the public and how to adapt to new trends, new technologies, and new methods of communication. Courts in Bosnia and Herzegovina are facing the same issues. Access of information has been important for a while, and there are discussions on how to regulate access to information regarding cases, including, of course, information of public interest, such as facts about events of the war or organized crime and corruption judge related judgments, as well as terrorism related judgments. There are new issues opening related to public office, spending public money, employment, appointment, etc. And as I said, the judicial system in Bosnia and Herzegovina has been dealing with the issue of transparency, but we don't seem to have harmonized communication practices nor positions about how to communicate with the public. The pandemic made this issue even more important, not only in Bosnia and Herzegovina, but also across Europe. And it gave all the courts a challenge how to secure the public nature of their work in the circumstances where even trials and deliberations are made very complicated. That is why we have supported an investigation by the Media Center in Sarajevo that analyzed how the judicial institutions on one hand and the media on the other hand acted during the crisis, how the judicial institutions communicated during the pandemic and how the media reported during the pandemic. These two reports are before you today. The reports focus on the first few months of the pandemic and they indicate problems related not only to the extraordinary situation, but also to the regular situation. One of the conclusions is that good communication 
among courts depended on the individuals in those institutions, their professionalism, how accommodating they are, how responsible the spokesperson is. But what's missing is a more consistent communication policy and a more strategic approach. All that shows that the decision, our decision, to focus this year on transparency, and if you recall, Mr. President, we decided this in November 2019, it was the right decision. We chose the topic at the previous forum, inspired by Lord Lee, the President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, who shared with us at the time the way the Supreme Court of the UK communicates with the public. And today, again, we'll hear Lord Reid. He will also speak about communication during COVID. There were then consultations with the judiciary, and everybody thought this was a very important topic. The importance of this topic and this event is confirmed by the fact that today we'll have the president of the European Court of Human Rights Mr. Robert Spano, the President of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, as I said, and Mr. Vehabovic, a judge of the European Court of Human Rights. At the very end, allow me to thank all of you for making this event possible today. I also thank President Knezevic wholeheartedly, Vice President Tadic, and all the staff of the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina who've been our partners for a long time. We have excellent cooperation across a host of activities. I'm happy to see that President Knezevic is finishing his term of office with an event like this, but we're looking forward to our cooperation with the court, with the new president and with Judge Knezevic. I also want to thank the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, President Lagundia, for his support, and I'm looking forward to our future cooperation with the entire Secretariat. I also thank Matthew Field, the ambassador of the United Kingdom to Bosnia and Herzegovina and the UK embassy, as well as the UK government for their determination to support the rule of law in this country and across the region. And finally, I want to thank the representatives of all the courts and representatives of the media who are here with us today. Thank you for responding to our invitation, despite the health risks. If it weren't for you, there'd be no event. I wish us all fruitful work. Thank you. So let's see if this microphone works. Thank you, Ms. Brightwhite. Mr. Halil Lagumtia, President of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, you have the floor, sir. So once again, good morning, President Knezevic, Your Excellency, Ambassador Field, Ms. Brightwhite, representative of the European Court of Human Rights and the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, representatives of the judicial community and the media, dear guests. In view of the topic of today's judicial forum, public access and transparency of the judicial system. Let me underscore that the council is true to its mission, securing transparency of the institution, which is evident through different activities we conduct within our mandate through a well-established practice in order to restore public confidence in this institution as well as judiciary as a whole. The High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council understands that public confidence depends not only on how much we work to advance the system, but also how open and accessible is the information about this to the public. The midterm operational plan 2020-2022 defines specific objectives, advancing independence, efficiency and quality, accountability and transparency of the judiciary in Bosnia and Herzegovina, speaks undoubtedly to the determination of this institution to work on the transparency, as well as other aspects of our work. We do understand that openness of the judicial institutions and availability of information bears a positive impact on 
public understanding on how courts and prosecutors' offices function, thus affecting the public perception that justice is accessible to all under equal conditions. The Council works continuously to advance the transparency of judicial institutions in Bosnia-Herzegovina, respecting all the applicable laws and legal norms, as you can see from the different activities that this institution has been implementing on its own, as well as in collaboration with international partners. The High Judicial Prosecutorial Council tries to ensure the proactive aspect of transparency, making sure that as much information as possible is accessible to the public through various press statements sent regularly to the media as well as through publications through our web page the social media and other accessible means of communication we also update our web page regularly in addition to uh, news about the most recent activities. There's other useful information about the work of the judiciary in general. We also use social media to promote our work, allowing direct communication with the public. Activities of the Council in relation to improving transparency of the judiciary primarily relates to publication of judgments through an electronic database as of May 2008. It has been updated regularly. Final rulings of the highest courts and all the related lower court judgments. It's uh, also my pleasure to inform you all that this database is also open to the public without any restrictions as of March this year. Through years of presenting judgments, the Council has dedicated resources to ensuring that the database is as simple as possible for users. This was also aided by our partner courts across the country. They selected judgments to be included. They indexed them in order to improve searchability. The database currently has 13 and a half thousand judgments uh, that can be searched with uh, different parameters, date of delivery, the court, the key legal notions, applicable laws, but also through simple text search. One of the recent steps we took to improve transparency, let me say that the Council adopted a new uh, instruction on how to anonymize court rulings to establish a fair balance between public interest in being informed about the work of the judiciary and the need to protect privacy of the persons appearing as parties in court proceedings. We are trying to improve methods for anonymizing court rulings in order to ensure that those rulings can be understood, but also respecting the need to protect personal data, observing the law and courts, our own guidelines for the publication of uh, prosecutorial and judicial decisions, including international standards in this area, also the opinions of the Data Protection Agency of Bosnia-Herzegovina, as well as uh, the 2020 opinion, and the new purpose of publishing court rulings. With this instruction, we will not anonymize data where there's a clear public interest for their publication, such as full name or nickname of persons sentenced for war crimes and other crimes related to international law, because these are crimes that are not subject to any statutes of limitation. We will also not anonymize judgments relating to organized crime and corruption, as well as other crimes where there is a particular public interest in knowing full data as the guidelines describe this process to harmonize our practice with international standards assisted by the EU, the EU Council intensified 
its uh, dissemination of information about international standards. We published information on more than 1,000 cases of the European Court of Human Rights. Since May last year, this information is prepared in collaboration with the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina. There are weekly updates on the most recent decisions and judgments of the European Court of Human Rights, thus ensuring that the public has access to reliable information about the most recent jurisprudence of the European Court in the languages of Bosnia-Herzegovina with summaries of uh, key justifications. It's a matter of days after those rulings have been published. In December 2019, in collaboration with the OSCE, we took over the war crimes map. And as of January 2020, we've been updating the map and preparing summaries to enter them into the war crimes map in our languages and in English. Until today, we've had summaries for more than 60 final judgments in war crimes cases. Along with the summaries, we also enter full judgments as the most uh, relevant public information. The Council is also planning a an organized crime and corruption map using EU funds, thus making this segment of the work of the judiciary transparent. Training on collaboration with the media has been going on continuously in collaboration with entity uh, judicial training centers in order to improve transparency of our institution in 2015. The High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council made its own sessions public, making it possible for the media and the public to observe our meetings through a video link. As for disciplinary procedures against holders of uh, judicial offices, which are also important for the public, often in the focus of media reports, the uh, council continued with its practice of publishing anonymized disciplinary rulings on our web page. The media and the public can also observe disciplinary procedures with and in, with uh, previous appointments in order to improve transparency in this area, we have activities related to rules that are supposed to regulate the publication of all the decisions taken during the proceedings, publication of uh, personal financial reports of holders of judicial office has been in the public eye for a while, and the council is determined to find the right legislative framework to regulate verification, storage, processing of such data because the council is not allowed to apply secondary legislation that should regulate this issue until we have found proper legal basis to regulate this area. The Council is securing the possibility for uh, judicial office holders to publish their own financial statement uh, reports on our web page. We also have activities in relation to strengthening judicial capacities for public relations and cooperation with the NGO sector. We thus continue to monitor the level of implementation of the strategy for treatment of persons communicating with the prosecutor's office in order to improve communication with the public, with the civil sector, the media, and other parts of the community. As for uh, reactive transparency, we do observe the law on freedom of access to information, and we are um, we respond to all the queries. We also worked actively throughout the past year on designing our communication strategy, the primary role of which is to establish the method of communication of the council with different target groups in the public for the period 21, 2025, and to provide a framework and guidelines for strategic communication issues for courts and prosecutors' offices in Bosnia and Herzegovina. 
understanding that strategic communication in the judiciary hasn't been reapplied, especially by courts. We want to give the judicial community a document that they can use as the basis for their specific communication strategies, respecting all the differences that we have compared to other judicial institutions. The adoption of the strategy is expected by the end of this year. Additionally, we continue to work on our uh, Legal Chronicle magazine in collaboration with the Air Center, which is partly to be credited for uh, today's event. For those who don't know, it's a magazine that contains summaries of key cases of the highest courts of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina, the European Court of Human Rights, and the Court of Justice. These are just some of the activities that uh, the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council has been implementing. We will continue to do so to ensure quality information about the work of the judiciary for the media, the professional community, and our most valuable uh, target group, the citizens of Bosnia Herzegovina. Thank you very much. What's important, of course, is to hear what plans there are for the key regulatory body for the judiciary in Bosnia Herzegovina. And allow me to invite His Excellency Matt Field, the UK ambassador, to take the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, the foundation of democracy rests on free flow of information, specifically transparency of institutions is key for building a democratic society where citizens participate in the public life in an informed way the judicial institutions as the foundation of the guarantee of the rule of law should be the beacons of transparency the covid 19 pandemic made the work of the judiciary very difficult across the globe courts and prosecutors offices have faced unprecedented restrictions and as a, the consequences of the measures that had to be introduced are still felt in this country. The pandemic slowed down or deferred judgments and rulings. It also made investigations very difficult. The pandemic has also shown us how important the work of the media is in general as a corrective factor in any society. That is why it's necessary for the information controlled by the judicial institutions to be publicly available to the journalists, to representatives of civil society organizations and the citizens even during crises. Timely presentation of information is crucial for preventing the dissemination of misinformation. Judiciary in this country has had some results regarding its transparency. The High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council has invested efforts to organize the issue of proactive access to information in courts and prosecutors' offices to strike a balance between the public interest and the right to protection of privacy. It is the right of the public to know. The judiciary is obliged to improve public confidence in its work and to act responsibly towards the public. The challenges raised by this topic cannot be resolved at once, but it's important that we work on them. That is why we're particularly happy to see this issue raised at the level of the highest judicial institutions in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Thank you very much. Thank you, Your Excellency. Let me say once again how grateful we are to the UK government for your support and assistance to the UK Embassy and personally to Ambassador Field, whose contribution has been the source of support to the judicial system of Bosnia and Herzegovina for years now, showing how much we can do together and a personal observation, in my, if I may, Ambassador Field is also capable of addressing us in our own language. So thank you once again for that particular personal effort. In a few moments, dear colleagues, we will
hear from a distinguished judge, Robert Spano, who is the president of the European Court of Human Rights. His address today, transparency and the importance of confidence building, will also be the key direction for our uh, discussion today, but we'll also hear about how the European Court of Human Rights hears this. Yes, yes. yes I hear you very well. Do you hear me? <laughs> yes, of course. Thank you very much for your reference and floor is yours. Thank you again. Thank you very much uh, to all the organizers, uh, President Knezevic, uh, Mrs. Braithwaite. Uh, thank you very much for uh, organizing and inviting me to this online judicial forum. It is a great pleasure to me for me to be here with you. You have chosen an extremely interesting and timely subject matter uh, for your forum, Transparency and Public Access to the Judiciary. You might ask, why is this timely? I would say one can answer that uh, for two reasons. The first is we are witnessing what some commentators have called rule of law backsliding in certain European states, uh, recent litigation, both in my court, uh, the European Court of Human Rights, and in the European Court of Justice of the European Union have demonstrated in particular on the issue of judicial independence, the growing tensions between the executive parliament and the judiciary. This requires mutual awareness. It requires us to be open and live to uh, the fact that the stakes are high, which is why current challenges to the independence of our judges should be taken seriously. I'm particularly thankful and, and happy to share the virtual stage with my good friend, Lord Reed of uh, the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, uh, because I am fully aware that his wisdom and uh, uh, contribution will be of immense importance for this topic. Indeed, steps taken to increase transparency and public trust in the judiciary are more relevant now than ever. The second reason why this topic is so timely, it is because the COVID-19 pandemic has led to a number of restrictions. Restriction being posed on, uh, for us on, on the people for sanitary reasons. Basic freedoms have been restricted, including freedom of movement. Courts, like all institutions, have had to adapt their working procedures. Now, evidently, Ensuring court services and organizing public hearings has been extremely challenging for national authorities. Yet at the national and the international level, we have had to change our working practices in a variety of ways by recourse to online hearings, for example. As a result, the pandemic has accelerated a number of changes which were already in the pipeline. And I would venture to say will be positive in the long term. And I think in some ways these changes should be embraced. I'm going to proceed today in four parts. The first part, in my first part, I will look at uh, uh, ways to promote a better understanding of the work of judges within our democracy. Next, I will look at the importance of transparency in the context of the right to a fair trial under the European Convention on Human Rights. Thirdly, I would wish to set out how the Strasbourg Court has responded to the challenge of public justice through webcasting. And fourthly and finally, allow me to say a few words about justice during the pandemic and in particular the experience of the European Court of Human Rights. So now I turn to my first part, promoting the understanding of the role and the work of courts and enhancing public trust in the judiciary. As we all know, the judiciary is one of the three powers of every democratic state. An official, impartial, and independent judiciary is the cornerstone of a functioning system of democratic checks and balances. Judges, independent judges, judges that are in, not in fear of external pressure, are in a position to do their jobs as they are required to do, are the means by which powerful interests are restrained. 
they guarantee that all individual, individuals, irrespective of their backgrounds, are treated equally before the law. Justice is therefore an essential component of democratic societies and a key institution that needs to be protected. The justice system aims to resolve disputes concerning parties and by the decisions which it delivers to fulfill both what I would call a normative and an educative role, providing citizens with relevant guidance, information and assurance as to the law and to its practical applications. The levels of confidence in courts activity are not uniform, however. Adequate information about the functions of the judiciary and, the, and its role, its full independence from other state powers can therefore effectively contribute toward an increased understanding of the courts as the cornerstone of democratic constitutional systems as well as of limits of their activity. And I would want to focus here in particular on the axiological convergence, which needs to be in place between the three branches of government. Judges' independence must be preserved not only by judges themselves, but more importantly, by all elements of state power. Judges need to be protected from external pressures, and that requires that other branches of the separation of powers understand their role. And that is imperative that judges are free to be able to exercise their function in a manner which is commensurate to a democracy governed by the rule of law. There are a number of ways to make judicial institutions more accessible to the public at large and therefore enhance their transparency. We have seen quite a bit of that of late in very uh, interesting formats using information technology, public hearings, the broadcasting of hearings, visits to courts, of course, the physical visits that we so miss, at least in my court, communication and outreach activities by judges and in particular court presidents who are taking part in judicial dialogue of the type that I am engaged in here today. I have repeatedly and publicly said that the time of closed courts, the judge being divorced from his or her community, invisible as it were, is over. Although there are natural limits so as to safeguard the integrity of the judicial function, courts must be open, transparent, and dynamic institutions adapting to the times we live in. This has been one of the primordial elements of my mandate as president of the European Court of Human Rights, the understanding, the awareness of the need for courts to be live creatures within democracy, not to be monastic institutions where, which uh, do not allow for transparency and openness in their decision-making process. With that in turn, I, I would now like to go to my second part. The importance of transparency in a more technical context, in context of the right to a fair hearing under Article 6, Paragraph 1 of the European Convention. The public character of proceedings before judicial bodies protects litigants against the administration of justice in secret with no public scrutiny. The Kafkaesque trial is anathema to the right to a fair trial. It thus constitutes one of the means whereby confidence in the courts can be maintained, contributing to the achievement of the aim of a fair trial. Allow me to look at the importance of public hearings firstly in the criminal and then in the civil context, bearing in mind that the requirements of a fair trial are stricter in the criminal sphere. According to Strasbourg case law, the personal presence of an accused in criminal proceedings should be taken as the rule. An oral and public hearing constitutes a fundamental principle enshrined in the right to a fair trial. Accordingly, at first instance, there must be a tribunal which meets the requirements of Article 6. The, the accused has the right to have his case heard 
with the opportunity inter alia to give evidence in his own defense, hear the evidence against him and examine and cross examine the witnesses. However, the right to an oral hearing is not an absolute right. The principle of the right to an oral hearing in the civil context are set out in the grand chamber case of Ramos Nunez de Carvalho versus Portugal, a grand chamber judgment. The right to an oral hearing is one element underpinning the overall equality of arms between the parties to the proceedings. Dispensing with a hearing is possible, but only in exceptional circumstances. There exists a possibility to remedy the lack of oral hearing before the lower court. Concerning online hearings, one of the big challenges we have been facing in the virtual COVID environment the court has had the opportunity to pronounce on this particular type of hearing within the context of a criminal case, the case of Marcello Viola versus Italy, which was later confirmed in the Grand Chamber in Saknovsky versus Russia, although, to be clear, not during the pandemic. The court found that as regards the use of a video link this form of participation in proceedings is not as such incompatible with the notion of a fair and public hearing, but it must be ensured that the applicant is able to follow the proceedings and to be heard without technical impediments and that effective and confidential communication with a lawyer is provided for. However, recourse to this measure in any given case must serve a legitimate aim, such as prevention of disorder, prevention of crime, protection of witnesses and victims and comply with the reasonable time requirement. The same principles will apply also in the civil context. Let me now turn to the third point that I would like to discuss, the point regarding public justice at the European Court of Human Rights. Making justice better known and more understandable has become a major concern in a large number of states. The work of the Council of Europe and in particular the initiatives of the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice, CEFEJ, is particularly important and useful. Attending trials is obviously a way for citizens to discover their justice system and courts are widely open to the public. This is also possible at the European Court of Human Rights. And every, every year, of course, not in COVID times, but every year we have had over the past decade or so, no less than 18,000 visitors come to attend the hearings held in Strasbourg at the Human Rights Building. The court's hearings are public and are mainly attended by judges, lawyers, and law students from all over Europe and well beyond. Since 2007, no less than 214 grand chamber hearings and 60 grand chamber, hearing have, chamber hearings have been filmed and are visible on the court's website. This number increases every year. However, this possibility has its limits and unfortunately not all European citizens can travel to the court. This is why among the means used to create and strengthen confidence in justice, there is one that has become increasingly important, the webcasting of hearings. Indeed, as early as 2007, the court had put in place a system for broadcasting its hearings. This has been thanks to a voluntary contribution from Ireland. In launching the project in 2007, my predecessor, then president of the court, Jean-Paul Costa, stated, and I quote, lawyers, academics, journalists, and ordinary citizens, many of whom would never have been able to come to Strasbourg to attend a hearing, will be able to follow the proceedings from their homes and offices. They will be able to see and hear for themselves the arguments advanced for and against the finding of a human rights violation in respect of some of the most sensitive issues of the day. This will bring the convention closer to the ordinary citizens whom it is intended to serve and protect." Close, close quote. Let me just say very clearly at this point, human rights in particular have seen a resurgence 
of backsliding, a resurgence of critical debate vis-a-vis -vis the concept, the notion of what constitutes human dignity and human rights. We, those of us that are part of the human rights community, and I say this to all stakeholders, it doesn't matter whether they are judges, lawyers, practitioners, academics, human rights campaigners, human rights activists, uh, politicians who understand the importance of preserving and protecting human rights. We all have to work together to create a narrative of openness, a narrative of awareness, a narrative of understanding that the edifice of society, the edifice of public governance, the edifice of public morality has to be preserved and protected by people understanding the immense importance of human rights being protected at the grassroots level. This is an existential debate of openness and transparency, which we must all take part in, in openness, in good faith, and with a willingness to understand the difficulties we are facing. In this regard, the reason and the very important advantage of the system is that the hearings we are preserve, protecting and, and trying to promote are not only filmed, but they constitute or continue to be permanently accessible on the court's website. We want to be able to disseminate information about our work every day. The importance of this archive for many people is clear. Lawyers, judges, potential applicants, members of, of non-governmental organizations, and of course, the many law students interested in the court's work will all have this archive for years to come. I would also mention another important element, which I have had at the forefront of my mandate. Interaction with the press is also important for the transparency of justice. The press conference of the court is held annually in January. On this occasion in January, I presented the statistics of the past year, but I also discussed openly the major events that have, have occurred during this period. This year in January 2021, we for the first time had to hold a press conference in hybrid form with some local journalists present in the court's press room and many others following online. Questions were also sent in writing before the event and they were sent during the event online. In my view, this is the way to go for the future. The press conference, which I will hold in January of next year, whether or not we are still confronted with the online epidemic will also be done in the same manner because it simply creates more access for uh, the media community. And courts need to be in a position to, to explain their work, issues that have arisen for a mutual understanding of how we proceed. My fourth and final part, ladies and gentlemen, President Knezhevitz, uh, is the issue of uh, effective communication during the pandemic. The functioning of all judicial system has been severely disrupted. That is clear. I would like to mention here the declaration on lessons learned and challenges faced by the judiciary during and after the COVID-19 pandemic, which was adopted by the European Commission for the Efficiency of Justice and sets out seven guiding principles. I would urge all uh, uh, judges in the Balkans, in the Western Balkans, to have a look at these criteria. As far as the judiciary is concerned, it underlines that the continuous functioning of the judiciary and of the services provided by justice professionals needs to be ensured based on European standards. Trust in justice must continue even at a time of crisis. I will now conclude by looking at the functioning of the Strasbourg court during the pandemic. Like every domestic court, we have had to adapt to the unprecedented situation represented by the COVID-19 crisis. Several exceptional measures were taken by the court during the French national lockdown. The first period being from 16 March to 10 May of last year. Most importantly, the then president of the court, Alexandre Sicilianos, 
extended the six month time limit for the lodging of an application under Article 35 of the European Convention on Human Rights based on force majeure reasoning for three months until 15 June 2020 inclusive. The time limits, time limits which have been allotted in pending proceedings were also extended for a month period from 16 March and they were also extended for another two month period from 16 April. Teams were put in place to ensure the continuity of dealing with requests for interim measures under Rule 39. The work was done entirely, entirely remotely. It is interesting to note that the more than 80% of the cases dealt with in this period concerned COVID-19. The European Court has been able to fulfill its public service mission during the French lockdown period by ensuring the continuity of its core activities including the handling of urgent cases and receiving and allocating applications to the relevant judicial formations. The Grand Chamber, Chambers, Committees, and single judges continue to examine cases by way of a written procedure. As a result of this activity, the total stock of pending cases has uh, thankfully remained stable. Ladies and gentlemen, as an international court, the most significant achievement has been the organization of the hearings. The court took the decision to hold online hearings with the exclusion of the public. However, we managed to ensure through the use, I would say the creative use of information technology, the public character of those hearings, which took place by video conference and which the outside world was able to watch online. This was a major technical challenge for us. A number of video conference series have taken place, six in 2020, and three so far in 2021. One more will take place indeed tomorrow morning. I know that we have had very many viewers. Thousands of views of these hearings have taken place online, and we have received very positive feedback, particularly from the national courts who inquired about our functioning during the pandemic. The court has on many occasions emphasized the special role in society of the judiciary, which as the guarantor of justice, a fundamental value in a law governed state must enjoy public confidence if it is to be successful in carrying out its duties. These are not my words. This is a direct quotation from the seminal grand chamber judgment in the case of Baca versus Hungary of 2016. Yet, ladies and gentlemen, ensuring public confidence cannot be left to chance. I have attempted to demonstrate that courts themselves can and should take proactive measures to enhance public trust in the institution of the judiciary. This is even more important during periods of crisis, such as the global pandemic, which has limited the public access to courts and in some cases reduce the court's functioning. Now more than ever, we have together to redouble our efforts to make sure that justice is not simply done, but is also seen to be done. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, President Knezhevitz. It was a great pleasure to be with you here today, and I hope and I wish you all the best for a fruitful engagement for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Your Excellency, President Spano, thank you again. Thank you to a very important reference in direct line over your experiences, not only European court, all courts in Europe, and in the basically transparency, like integral part in protect human rights and freedoms. So thank you one more. And uh, I hope to see you next time in Sarajevo, in Bosnia and Herzegovina, for your official visit. Thank you. Zahvaljujem još jedan put i ovako nama, predsjedniku Spanu. The European Court today um, will have a grand chamber hearing where President Spana will be announcing the judgment of an, of an important case 
it is related to pandemic measures and interception of um, communications and really um, contemporary monitoring and surveillance through mobile phones. Now, let us just check whether we have His Excellency Lord Reed with us. Good. So it is my particular pleasure to inform you that we will now hear from Lord Reed. Whose presentation at an earlier forum Okay. Can you start now? I'm delighted to have been invited by President Metovic to contribute to this year's Judicial Forum. I'm sorry that I can't join you live as I'm sitting in a hearing of our court on the 25th of May. Instead, I've recorded this presentation. The last year has presented significant challenges for courts in both our jurisdictions and indeed for courts across the world. We have had to adapt to working remotely at a distance not only from our colleagues, but also from the parties and the public. With our court buildings closed, we have had to find new ways to ensure that justice is done and is seen to be done. This is an opportunity for me to share with you our experience of dealing with these challenges in the UK Supreme Court. I hope you may find something which is of value to you when thinking about how these matters might be addressed in your own courts. I'm going to focus on three aspects of our work, the conduct of hearings, the delivery of judgments, and the provision of educational programs. Over the last year, the most significant change has been to how we conduct our hearings. Before the pandemic, every appeal was determined following a public hearing held in our court building in London. It became apparent during the week commencing the 16th of March last year, that significant changes to working life and travel in the UK were liable to be introduced in response to the spread of coronavirus. During the course of that week, the court moved rapidly to develop a web conferencing system for holding hearings and to train the justices in its use. The Prime Minister announced lockdown in the United Kingdom on the 23rd of March last year. The next day, the Supreme Court held its first online hearing with the justices working from their homes and counsel either in their homes or in their offices. The hearing was held using the Cisco WebEx platform. The court has continued to operate in this way for all hearings since then. Throughout the pandemic, we've been determined to ensure that our hearings remain accessible to the public. We've therefore continued to live stream all of our hearings on our website. Although members of the public cannot currently come and sit in the public galleries of our courtrooms, they can still observe all our hearings as they take place. The recordings are uploaded onto our website afterwards, so there's an archive of all our proceedings, which can be viewed at any time. Here is an example of the beginning of a hearing. Welcome to the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom, where today we are hearing uh, the appeal in the case of uh, Lloyd and Google. Um, the case is concerned with a claim uh, brought by uh, Mr. Lloyd alleging that Google uh, breached uh, various duties under the Data Protection Act uh, to users of Apple iPhones. And the issue for the court uh, is whether uh, Mr. Lloyd should 
have been uh, refused permission to serve uh, a representative claim against Google uh, out of the jurisdiction of England and Wales. I'm hearing this appeal with four colleagues whom I'll introduce now. Uh, First Lady Arden. Good morning. Lord Sales. Good morning. Lord Leggett. Good morning. And Lord Burrows. Good morning. Um, we'll be hearing first the submissions on behalf of the appellant, Google, uh, who are represented by Mr. Anthony White, Queen's Council, and uh, Mr. Edward Craven. So I'll invite Mr. White now to begin his submissions. My lords and my lady, in this appeal, I appear with Mr. Craven for the appellant, Google LLC. My learned friends, Mr. Tomlinson QC, Mr. Campbell QC, and Ms. Wakefield QC, appear for the respondent, Mr. Lloyd. My learned friends, Mr. Fachena QC, and Mr. Grubeck, appear for the Information Commissioner, who's been given permission to intervene and to make oral submissions. There are five other interveners who have been given permission to intervene by way of written submissions. My lords and my lady, the case raises important questions of law relating to the meaning of damage in section 13 of the data protection. The use of video conferencing technology has required a significant commitment from our IT team and other support staff. For each hearing, guidance on arrangements is sent to the parties in advance, and our IT team conducts pre-hearing test sessions with counsel. Both the test sessions and the hearing require two members of the IT team, IT team. One member is on hand to deal with any technical issues and to provide support or handle queries. The other member of the team prepares footage from previous days for publication online and ensures that the live feed is stable and runs properly. Overall, the feedback we've received from users involved in remote hearings has been very positive. Some minor technical problems were encountered in the initial hearings, but were addressed. We also adapted the system in response to user feedback, for example, so that it's possible for those watching the live stream of each hearing to see all of the justices at the bottom of the screen, as well as the person who is speaking. We're conscious that participating in a remote hearing is a different experience from taking part in a hearing in court. Council have reported that remote hearings are more tiring and that it can be more difficult to involve junior counsel and to take instructions during the hearing. We've responded by introducing a short break mid-morning and by allowing adjournments when instructions have to be taken. We're also conscious that there's not the same spontaneous interaction between the participants in a remote hearing as there is in a courtroom and the experience for litigants and members of the public is also very different. So we're looking forward to returning to hearings in the court building as soon as it's possible to do so. Turning to judgments, our efforts to ensure openness and accessibility continue after the hearing. Once we have reached a decision, we take a number of steps to help the public understand what we have decided and why. These have been largely unchanged by the pandemic. First, all our judgments are published in full on our website. Each is accompanied by a short video in which the justice who has written the lead judgment explains what the case is about and what the court has decided in language which non-lawyers can understand. The videos are streamed live on our website at the time the judgment is handed down and are then made available afterwards on our website and our YouTube channel. We also provide a written press summary of each of our judgments. The summaries cover the factual background of the appeal and the reasons for the court's judgment. They are written in plain language and are intended to support accurate reporting of our judgments by the press. Here is an example. Turning next to education and outreach, 
transparency is not just about explaining what we have decided in individual cases, but also improving public understanding of our role and functions more generally. When I spoke to you in Sarajevo in 2019, I emphasized the importance of physical access to the court building in that regard. I told you about our open days and tours and our gift shop and public cafe. It has not been possible to provide public access of that kind during the pandemic. Our building has been closed for almost all of the last year. So we have moved our education and outreach work online. We've developed a 360 degree tour of the Supreme Court building, which enables members of the public to explore three of our courtrooms, our main event spaces and the Justices Library on our website. You can see it here. We also offer interactive tours on Microsoft Teams, which are led by an experienced tour guide covering everything from the role of the court in the UK constitution to the history of the court building and the artwork displayed there. Since June of last year, we've conducted 85 virtual tours for schools, villages and universities across the UK and 15 virtual tours for governmental and other public sector organisations, including the Houses of Parliament and the Ministry of Justice. We recently started offering guided virtual tours to members of the general public. We also run other programmes which give school and university students the opportunity to interact directly with the justices. So far this year, we've run nine Ask a Justice sessions which are live question and answer sessions between a group of students aged 16 to 18 and the justice of the court. Here are some photographs. We have also run five university mooting competitions, each judged by a justice. And we've run 15 debate days during which young people are given the opportunity to prepare and participate in a debate on a topical legal issue coached by professional lawyers. We have also expanded the range of educational materials that are available to download on our website. There are lesson plans on human rights and the separation of powers for students aged 16 to 18, and there's even a Supreme Court colouring book aimed at children under 11. Here's an illustration. In many ways, the changes brought about by the pandemic have enhanced our education and outreach work. By making everything available online, we've been able to reach schools and colleges that are too far away or don't have the resources for a visit to London. We've seen an increase in participation from students from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, as well as the north of England. This strengthens our message that the Supreme Court is a court for the whole of the United Kingdom. Looking forward, we are currently preparing to return to the court building. For as long as social distancing continues to be necessary, we'll only be able to use our largest courtrooms and staff will be working in the building on a rotor basis. Home working and the use of web conferencing 
for a proportion of hearings may continue to be necessary for some time. Our intention, however, is to return to hearing all appeals in person and to welcoming members of the public back to the court building as soon as we can. Ja sam malo pre komentarišemo. Zahvaljujem Lordu Ridu naravno ovaj na trudu. Thank you to Lord Reed for presenting us the experiences of the Supreme Court of the UK. I was just commenting with colleagues how many great ideas, so many of them applicable here, I think, for president of the highest regular court, some of these possibilities. Um, other possibilities of things that we can also apply here. The pandemic has changed attitudes and approaches to what is essentially intellectual creation, because running a trial and adjudicating is a form of creative intelligence or intelligent creation. So we are now doing, we will be doing a quick um, switch around, like in a hockey game, because we are moving on to our panel discussion. Now, participants, the panelists, are the Vice President of the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Mato Tadic, Vesna Antonic, President of the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska, Vesna Čorović Stankovic, President of the Supreme Court of the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Damjan Kaurinovic, President of the Appellate Court of the Bershko District, Emira Hodzic, Registrar at the Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina, Admir Suljagic, the Director of the Secretariat of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council. So I'd like to invite them to take their places here. Um, it'll take us about three to five minutes uh, to do the switch. Herzegovina. Vesna Antonic, President of the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska. Vesna Čorović Stanković, President of the Supreme Court of the Federation of Bosnia Herzegovina, Damjan Kaurinović, President of the Court of Appeals of the Brčko District, Emira Hodić, Registrar of the Court of Bosnia Herzegovina, and Admir Suljagić. Director of the Secretariat of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council. In this panel, each panelist will take some five minutes to give a cross cutting view of their institution in relation to public communication. We coordinated this with our panelists to prepare discussions, and after that, there'll be time for questions and answers. So please, let's try to stick to the five minutes as much as possible. So without further ado, I will now give the floor to Mr. Tadic, Vice President of the Constitutional Court. Thank you, Mrs. Brightwhite, ladies and gentlemen. There's a problem, of course, sticking to five minutes. We lawyers have always this desire to exceed our allocated time. So, as announced, I'll try to be brief in conveying the most important aspects of this topic. First, in general, we've already heard several interventions. Transparency is the key feature of modern democracies. On one hand, it allows every citizen to receive information on the work of public authorities, thus strengthening the citizen's active role in the work of state authorities. It is also an obligation of the state to make such information available to its citizens. 
Transparency is particularly important for judicial institutions for different reasons. It promotes responsibility, it contributes to the rule of law, greater transparency, and the authorities in general. Openness of the judiciary improves the flow of information between the judiciary and the community, allowing the community to better understand their work. It downgrades the legitimacy of all those who work in the judiciary, although according to the Constitution we're not part of the system of ordinary jurisdiction because of our position as the corrective of all the three branches of government, we are particularly important, more so because we have a very complex constitutional system and the Constitutional Court plays a particular role in building the standards of democracy, including transparency in the work of public authorities, including this court. This corrective role is important, and this complexity of the constitutional order in Bosnia and Herzegovina also contributes to the special status of the constitutional court. We had a debate yesterday, the president and I, with a legal team from Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is promoting the idea that the constitutional court is some kind of a supreme court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which doesn't exist formally. I won't dwell on that. I'm just saying this because of the significance of our decisions and the significance of our public interventions through our work. It's also important that the work of the Constitutional Court is as public as possible, accessible not only to the authorities but also to the citizens and legal entities so that they know about the work of the Constitutional Court so that they can use our rulings to advance the rule of law. The Constitutional, the Constitutional of Bosnia Herzegovina has a chapter, Article 6, prescribing the composition, organization, competences and powers of the Constitutional Court to adopt its own rules of procedure. However, Article 6.2b also contains another provision. The court shall conduct public hearings and will justify and publish its rulings. So the Constitution obliges the court to be public and transparent in its work through public hearings, which is something that we've heard about today, and from the European Court in Strasbourg and Lord Reed. So participants, parties to the proceedings and others have the possibility to present to the court their position on the legal issue at hand. All the decisions need to be justified and published. These are constitutional provisions that we, of course, must uphold. All this is elaborated further in our rules, adopted again pursuant to the Constitution as explained. How do we do that? Transparency is ensured by announcing our sessions and our public hearings, notifying the public on the procedures, submitting public statements to the media, holding press conferences, allowing parties to the proceedings to examine the cases that the court the case that the court is deciding upon to to attend public hearings unless there is the interest of morality public order and national security until as we decide otherwise publishing our rulings publishing key decisions and otherwise as prescribed by the constitutional court in its rules notification on public hearings are announced on the web page and the notice board and they're also forwarded to the media on the web page we also have all the rulings of the constitutional court rules of the court also prescribe that parties to the proceedings can examine the case file of the case before the court pursuant to the rules and applicable laws regulating access to information, parties may also request copies of the document except for those that are exempted from this rule by law. Draft decisions are deliberated, those that are marked as confidential, they cannot be submitted. Also, we cannot give information on judge rapporteur and 
the council working on that in the interest of transparency it's important to note dissenting opinions pursuant to the rules of the court every judge participating in the case may present a dissenting opinion or just to make a statement about a separate opinion of dissent or concord this is an element of transparency which we present to the public presenting different views these dissenting opinions are published along with the ruling they're accessible to all the parties and they show exactly how the court deliberated and how there were different legal thoughts not corresponding to the one adopted by the majority in its ruling. Transparency is largely aided by its publishing department. Starting from 97, the Constitutional Court has been publishing its Gazette in the languages of Bosnia and Herzegovina, in 2020 by 2020 we have published 30 volumes two per year and four volumes of selected rulings in english in addition to this we have a well-developed uh, um, activity that uh, air center launched the digest versions in english and in our languages we, these are summaries of all our rulings, and after each session, there's a service that uses our decision to prepare a summary. It is accessible to the public. We also publish it once we have compiled a number of such summaries. They're also printed to make it available in hard copy as well to courts of ordinary jurisdiction, the citizens, and the entire uh, legal system. Publication of the rulings of the Constitutional Court in hard copy is informative, but it is also our contribution to the development of the rule of law, protection and promotion of the importance of human rights and fundamental freedoms, and better functioning of the rule of law, and the development of a democratic society in general. The options provided by modern electronic communication are used more and more. We've heard about that. And President Knezhevich did draw your attention to the fact that these ideas that we've heard about we can take on and develop irrespective of our modest financial and technical capabilities. That's no obstacle to hard work to make us uh, accessible to the public even that way. I welcome the decision of the Council of Ministers in January 21, and uh, President Lagumdia said that they started doing so in March, publishing decisions of courts of ordinary jurisdiction with no restrictions. This will certainly improve the transparency of our work. At the end, to uphold my time limit, let me add something. An earlier speaker, Lord Reader, Mr. Spano, mentioned the understanding of court's rulings. We have to try to make sure that our decisions are understood. It's not just about saying we've taken a decision of such and such content. For our transparency to be ensured and for the trust to be there, we have to make sure that the citizens and others, I mean, legal persons and other uh, parts of society, such as public authorities, that they understand our rulings. In that, I have a we have a serious problem, I think. The reason for that, in my opinion, is that we don't have properly trained media personnel to deal with this particular issue so that they can actually present it to the public adequately. I have personally thought about perhaps a possibility to organize. I'm not favoring any method, be it a seminar, training for the media, print and electronic, a guidebook, for them to be able to understand our rulings better, to be able to better convey them to the public. 
Courts of ordinary jurisdiction have their own procedures regulated by uh, procedural legislation. The Constitutional Court has its own procedures, which are very different from courts of ordinary jurisdiction. As a rule, we don't see parties directly. We don't have an adversarial system in the courtroom. Our debates are different. We need to understand the procedure, how to reach a decision to be able to convey its content. And Bilena, this is certainly one of the topics that we can think about. How can we, from the judiciary, in the widest sense, how can we contribute to a better understanding of our decisions by the media, which I think will also make it better understandable to the public as well. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, it was a pleasure for us to support the Constitutional Court in improving its web page. And within that, we have these new videos now available, one on the work of the Constitutional Court, the other on submission of applications. That is a step towards what you mentioned, Mr. Vice President, in the preparation for this event. Lord Reed shared with us quite a bit of what they do, among other things. In Britain, there's a number of journalists who do report, particularly from the Supreme Court. They are accredited in a way. It's not official, but these are journalists who report from the Supreme Court in particular. They are in dialogue constantly, even anticipating sensitivity of certain decisions, giving the right picture to ensure that reporting is as professional as possible and to meet the public interest as well as possible to give them complete information. So we can talk about this with you and with media representatives and find a model that would be acceptable to everybody. And now let me invite Mrs. Antonich, President of the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska. You can stand, uh, you can sit, whichever you prefer. Good afternoon. Dear colleagues, representatives of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, on behalf of the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska, let me give you a general introduction and then I'll move to what our court does. Free flow of information is the basis of democracy. When we look at it from the vantage point of the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska, we have to ensure transparency of its work without citizens believing that we ensure the rule of law, our work would make no sense and have no purpose. It's good to be reminded of the well-known maxim, justice should not just be done, it needs to be seen to be done, because it's, and that's why it's important to give the simple definition to work and speak about our work. When it comes to the public nature of our work, it's important to mention the legislative framework, Article 9 of the Law and Courts, prescribing that our work is transparent unless otherwise prescribed by law. The public nature is secured through public hearings, publication of the composition of the court, the trial chambers, and notifying the public about the progress of different cases. The public is also informed according to Article 9 by the publication of our decisions and by provision of other information of interest to the public with anonymizing, of course, the judgment. We had to develop a set of rules for that. We also need to note the law on protection of personal data, Article 3 of the law, which prescribes that a criminal judgment is a separate category and Article 10 prescribing that criminal judgment data cannot be automatically data processed unless the law provides for adequate protection. Furthermore, Article 251 of the Law on Criminal Proceedings of Republika Srpska and analog articles of the Criminal Code and Criminal Procedure Code in Bosnia Herzegovina, limited access to certain information 
until the main hearing ex officio upon proposal of the parties, we need to exclude the public for the entire examination in chief or some of its part, if it's in the interest of uh, state security um, guarding any type of secret public order, morality, personal or private life or the def of the defendant or the um, plaintiff, minors or witnesses. It's also important that there are guidelines issued by the High Judicial and Prosecutorial uh, Council on these procedures and witness uh, and victim protection. There are internal documents of the court of importance. Our public relations strategy, a guide uh, for access to information or publication of information controlled or in possession of the court, an index register of information held by the court, a form to request access to information, rules on um, process of anonymizing decision, the web page editorial board and all other documents of importance for our public communication. These are the strengths used by the Supreme Court. Let me say something about the weaknesses as well. First, we don't have a department covering public relations, nor is it envisaged in our internal structure. And communication is one of the duties of the uh, court secretary. It's a lawyer who's taken a bar exam, licensed, who also served as a judge, it's a very competent individual, adding to that various training. She's attending one such training today, of course, she's competent, but these are certainly some of the weaknesses of our court when it comes to communication. The Supreme Court is open to the citizens and the media, and we have a proactive approach to communication regarding the work of the court whether such information has been requested or not. This court is one of the few that publishes its case law. Anonymized, of course, the only weakness is that it's not searchable. And we're grateful to Air Center on the 31st of August. I hope we will implement this possibility, will be more accessible to the public. When it comes to being proactive in public relations, we have daily and monthly publication and announcements of uh, public hearings of the criminal department, all other information of importance for our work, and a host of monthly, quarterly, and annual reports. When it comes to reactive communication with the public, this is only a matter of free access to information in relation to the law that regulates it. In April, for example, we've had 20 such requests. In the previous year, we've had a total of 94 such requests. And we've heard from other speakers, COVID is largely uh, to blame for this decrease in 2019. We've had 156 requests, 172 in 2018, and so on. So in this year, in this COVID year, the number has been reduced significantly. So we have proactive and reactive communication with the public, but this doesn't mean that we're satisfied with the results. We can always do better, and I think this is an initial stage. Openness of the court is one of the ways of building public confidence in the work of the court and a democratic control of the court. We'll try to develop better access to information. We've heard some very important suggestions applicable in our circumstances, hoping to thus stop this loss of confidence in the judiciary in general, also securing the possibility to promote greater public confidence. The openness of the Supreme Court is key in the development of a democratic society where citizens participate in the public life with adequate information. We'll certainly work on that. Thank you very much.
Thank you, President. I have to say that we worked together under the auspices of the High Judicial Prosecutorial Council with the assistance of the EU and uh, the Centre. We were impressed by how much the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska has already done in organizing and preparing this. We need to make this more systematic and present it to the public, which will be made possible as a autumn. We will then do our best to promote it properly to courts of lower instance, first and foremost, to ensure better harmonization. We're here to support you in whatever you further identify as a possibility for improving transparency. I also think that we heard, particularly from Lord Reed, some very practical things. Some of them cannot be done here, but some can. Some very inspiring ideas, so we're absolutely open to this, and thank you for being open to further improvement of transparency. Let me now invite uh, President Josovic Stankovic President of the Supreme Court of the Federation of Bosnia-Herzegovina, to tell us about the court. Thank you. In particular, I'd like to greet uh, the director of our center, all the court presidents, representatives of the media, and all my colleagues taking part in this uh, judicial forum. I'm very happy to have this opportunity to take part in this forum. As the director has already said, I'm the president of the Supreme Court as of the 1st of January this year. And let me tell you something as specific as possible about the transparency in our work. The key law regulating the transparency is the Criminal Procedure Code of the Federation prescribing that the, that the main hearing is public, as you know. With the second, if the second judgment is abolished or vacated, there's a case before the Supreme Court. Applying this provision, public hearings are public with parties and their legal counsel unless public has been excluded. If the court decides to do so, for reasons stated in the law. According to the law on free access to information, any legal and natural person has the right of access to information in compliance with the public interest and the Supreme Court as a public authority is responsible for presenting information unless there's a legally prescribed exception. If there is justified public interest, the court is obliged to give such information. In the past year, the Supreme Court has received 124 requests for access to information by the media, the citizens, and other natural persons. The spokesperson of the court has responded to all these requests within the prescribed deadline. Public queries by the media, the citizens, and other natural persons were mainly in relation to information on judgments and rulings as well as decisions on detention and judgments and other decisions, but also with clarifications of certain rulings. Thus, we granted access in 121 case. Three requests were resolved otherwise. The Supreme Court of the Federation also manages a web page with our own register and we also have our own editorial board. We have a public information and communication professional as of 2008. We have a, an employee who has a degree in journalism from the University of Sarajevo, also trained to work with the media on our behalf. The president or vice president of the court do give public statements only if it's a matter that only they can discuss. We have regular annual press conferences to present our annual reports as well as um, 
at other times if needed. Our program of work for 2021 and our strategic plan for the period 21-23, one of our strategic goals is advancing openness and access to our information by the public. We are planning certain measures to be taken to that effect and to prescribe a set of data to be published regularly on our web page. All the statistics, annual as well as periodic, public procurement, scheduling, rulings, work program of the court, and all the decisions important for the work of the court. According to our spokesperson of the past year, we have published about 50 different news items and of the past four months, we have uh, published some 20 news items. The law on protection of personal data does not regulate the publication of rulings and how they're to be communicated with the public. However, guidelines published by the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council indicate that when publishing court rulings, we need to strike a balance between anonymity and the right of the public to have full information on criminal proceedings. So our original texts are published or detailed statements or summaries pursuant to the recommendations by the council. By the end of 2020, we published statements on judgments and rulings of the civil department and other judgments have not been published. After the 21 work program has been adopted, we decided to publish all the judgments with legal reasoning. Until today, we have prepared a platform for judgments and other rulings for criminal and administrative units to be published. We're preparing the civil department platform and we've published an insignificant number of judgments. But we've published statements on some judgments as well. This holdup happened because of the inadequate human resources, but we're currently working on that. When it comes to anonymizing judgments or statements, because of the public interest pursuant to the guidelines, we do not anonymize documents about defendants in relation to war crimes, organized crime, corruption, and other crimes. If it's in the public interest, personal data is anonymized, witnesses are anonymized, locations and other elements accord in accordance with the rules on anonymous publication. We're working further to improve our communication, to ensure our transparency and openness to the public. The problems in communication with the public, in my opinion, are the following. One, shortcomings in the legislative framework impact negatively the transparency. The law doesn't regulate the issue of publication of judgments and how courts communicate with the public and guidelines are in fact recommendations and they're not binding and they are subject to interpretation obviously there's no clear legal framework that could be binding and applicable in all the judicial information this impacts inadequate transparency two in order to build public trust in the work of the courts in addition to legal possibilities for the public to attend hearings it is also necessary to publish confirmed indictments and judgments, of course, with anonymization, because these documents are important for informing the public so that they can monitor the cases. Maybe this is too ambitious, but I think for the most serious crimes, we need to consider this, that there should be live telecasts of uh, the hearings so that all the uh, parties interested citizens and others can follow. Three, in compliance with the recommendations by the Council, we should publish information about persons sentenced for war crimes, organized crime, corruption, and other crimes of 
too great a public interest. We publish it, but most courts anonymize it. A particular problem is also the lack of technical resources. We don't have our own web pages. So the Supreme Court, just like many other courses, there is a platform entitled Pravosuje. Dot BA, so that the council should work on technical advancement of this page so that it's better adapted to the users so that citizens, the journalists and the media can have access to more information. Some courts have their own web pages, such as the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, the Banja Luka um, District Court. This is, in fact, the, these are the most proactive courts number five for better public information we need the true partnership between the media the court and the prosecutor's offices for that purpose the council should organize joint workshops for the judiciary and the media to provide training for both sides and to observe an important step towards true partnership among the media the courts and the prosecutor's offices thus helping the media understand the system of the judiciary that we have in this country. Thank you very much. I tried to be as concrete as possible. Yes, we know in collaboration uh, with you, we know how much you've launched over the past few months so that you've given some excellent suggestions, very specific, and later on, we'll hear from Mr. Suljagic about uh, the plans and the guidelines, but this is something that is to be discussed definitely. And I have to say, I welcome this. Maybe we need to think about the implications and how this could be organized. But live telecasts of hearings could, in fact, be a good thing. The Supreme Court of the UK does have that. They have a 45 second delay if somebody says something that needs to be anonymized, presenting data that shouldn't be made public. But the fact is that the Brexit hearing was in fact seen by 5 million people live. It was very important for the entire country. On top of that, what they do, what could be interesting is that judge rapporteur usually upon a judgment, the judge gives a layperson's explanation about what the case was, what the judgment was, and then it's made available on YouTube. It's all on YouTube now, and they also have very high ratings. And that is what we can perhaps talk about. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now I will ask the Mr. Kaurinovic from the Court of Appeals of the Birchko District to tell us something about the experience of his court. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. First, I would like to commend the Constitutional Court and Air Center for organizing this forum under such complex circumstances. I will not be repeating what my colleagues have already said, but I do want to point out some specifics related to the Birchko district. We don't have a special PR department, but we do have a PR officer working for all of the judicial institutions. So this is um, a lawyer who's passed a bar exam. Our most frequent type of communication are press releases, and we have from 20 to 30 of those uh, every year. In terms of transparency of the justice system, in line with the state level law on freedom of access to information, we have a guidebook that is available both in hard copy and electronic format and a register of requests. What is important to point out is that in our work to date, we have responded positively to all freedom of access requests, uh, whether they be filed by the media or parties or lawyers, legal representatives. And of course, 
we delivered all of our decisions in line with the guidelines of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council. This is a right, the right to freedom of information is a right under the Constitution, under the Convention, and is also part of the practice of the HJPC. The transparency of the courts in the district is also reflected in the annual, their annual reporting to the district assembly, which is uh, broadcast live by local TV. So at least once a year, we appear before the assembly, we respond to questions from MPs on anything related to the work of court and we also hold a press conference if needed after the assembly or we give interviews at this uh, stage. We've also appeared in live TV and radio shows. But what is most important is that we deliver accurate and timely information. On average, we respond to media inquiries within eight days days, the legal deadline is 15 days. And um, perhaps I could also point out um, listening to what uh, my colleague Mr. Tadic said when it comes to requests under Rule 53, Article 53 of the Rules of Procedure, every all of the courts are obliged to submit at the request of a party the constitution of the judges panel. We believe this can lead to corruption or carries a corruption risk because we've had examples where pressure was, people attempted to exert pressure on judges once they found out they were on the panel of a specific case. In the constitutional court case, um, the rule that the makeup of the judges panel is not disclosed for proceedings that are underway. And I think maybe we should think about adopting that. Thank you. We have um, seen in other areas that Butko has made headway and what you have presented tells us that you're already going towards opening to the public and I assume you've also encountered similar challenges in this COVID period as your colleagues. I think this is another interesting issue that we can open in this panel, whether and or rather what are the risks of disclosing the composition of judges panels during proceedings and what is the public interest that is being protected while proceedings are underway and what are the risks and do you think that not the right balance has been struck or that the makeup of the panel should be disclosed only after uh, the judgment becomes final. I would now like to ask Emiram Khodjit, Registrar at the Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina, who will tell us about the work of the court. And we were actually working with them recently to help them improve transparency. Thank you, Bilanam. Today's topic is very current. There's practically no date that we're not talking about the importance of transparency of courts. The Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina is the highest court in the country and also the competences it has, is responsible for comprehensively com communicating with the public, terrorism, extradition, asylum, migrant smuggling, war crimes, complaints regarding elections. Uh, this is where the court is competent and these are areas of interest for the public and for the international community. The legal framework 
includes procedural laws and the law on the courts of Bosnia to govern and the law on freedom of access to information and the law on the protection of personal data. In 2014, at the Gen General Assembly of the Court, we adopted a rule book on access to information, determining the procedures to be followed by judges and other staff regarding requests for our access to information. They also deal with the publication of decisions and other information on our website, as well as working with citizens and communicating with media and other organizations. The Registrar's Office has an outreach and public information department. And our intention um, has been not just to respond to queries from the public, but to have proactive communication, two-way communication. The international community supported the functioning of our department through the International Registrar's Office, modeled on the ICTY. And we had a basic model that we then developed. The staff working in the department has a good cooperation with the media, but uh, further training, of course, is always a good thing. The external communication of the court goes through this department. The communication is by correspondence, by email, by t telephone. We also have a mobile phone for urgent matters when it comes to cases involving custody and pretrial detention. We have about 20 requests for free access to information a month. There are simple ones that aren't even registered in our database, but uh, we try to respond to uh, all interested parties uh, when it comes to information about hearings or urgent matters. We usually respond within a working day, two, three working days. However, if the request is more complex, requires statistical reports and the input of more than one department, then we stick to the deadline on 15 days. The information is available on our website. We have a web editorial board that updates the website regularly and we have a commission a committee of the court and the court staff to determine our information policy um, the register of information and the website is available to everyone so we publish uh, court decisions and in formative content on cases of public interest. So these are press releases, case summaries, weekly overviews of activities, a calendar of the trial and the hearings. There is a lot of interest on the part of the public for our, our decisions. We implement the guidelines of the AJPC on the publication of judges and prosecutorial decisions. We use them to pu publish cases of organized crime, corruption, war crimes, as well as a number of cases in the administrative law area. We also have a court bulletin, a case law bulletin, a lot of other informative content. I do want to go back to the press releases, though. So for cases that are of high interest for the public, such as decisions on remand and custody, first and second instance judgments, uh, the press release after the second instance judgment, and we also have press releases on other important topics of the work of the court, the status of judges, and the justice system as a whole. We also have a weekly overview of activities where we include information on any plea bargaining, um, protection measures, other information of importance for the public. We do not disclose uh, the names of witnesses or injured parties or the um, evidence exhibits. 
we also anonymize the decisions, the judgments that are published on the website. And we've had problems with this, mostly because of a lack of funding. So thanks to the support of the Air Center and the British Embassy, we will upgrade the search function of decisions. The course of Bosnia-Herzegovina is developing cooperation with the broader community. Up until the pandemic, we used to have a lot of visits from law students, from NGOs, international organizations, and we spoke to the visitors, uh, presented the work of the court. We usually have both judges and court staff participate in these um, visits, and we try to cover all the important segments of our work. I also want to point out that we have signed memorandums of understanding with um, the law faculties and NGOs, and the court is available to the NGO sector under these um, cooperation agreements. I also wanted to point out that um, we've also cooperated with the HJPC, and we had an open day for a pri for primary school pupils, and it was really interesting how we managed to present the work of the courtroom and the court to school children, and they found it interesting. And I hope that this is the start of further cooperation with the HJPC. We also organized uh, in cooperation with the OSCE. We did mock trials and moot courts for law students. Uh, we also worked with the law faculty in Sarajevo, and we organized a day in court for um, students in the last year of studies. And so they could talk to people at the registrar's office or with the president of the court with all the various judges unfortunately the pandemic has uh, made us postpone some of these activities but we hope to resume them and to also expand them to other faculties in other cities at the end i just want to point out as a problem in communicating with the public is that um courts conduct proceedings that are by their nature interesting to the public or of interest to the public. So there's the obligation to disclose information. However, judges must also act in line with procedural rules and there are certain limitations uh, to the information that courts can disclose and the freedom of access to information is not absolute. So there can be, the, the court cannot always live up to the expectations of the media of what it can disclose. I'm hoping that today's forum will offer the best solutions to open up the work of the courts to the public, but to also find mechanisms to ensure that we have training for both reporters and court staff and um, holders of judicial office that will align all of our practices with international standards of transparency in judicial systems. As uh, President Vesna said, you do um, work a lot and you've done a lot on your website and we were very happy to be able to support some of your activities to contribute further to this mission. I, at some point, you were also webcasting um, trials and hearings. Um, and I think you can comment on this some more. I'm sure that you had practical challenges that you can share from your experience. It was also interesting how you opened the court to young people, and this is something that we've heard from Lord Reed, and that's very inspiring. We've heard from UNICEF as well. Um, they asked us whether courts would be interested in doing something like this, and we've heard that uh, the courts of Bosnia-Herzegovina and HJPC have already worked on this. 
And of course, cooperation with law faculties. We were also thinking about bringing together students uh, from different universities. And uh, it seems to me that some topics are already appearing. Um, a number of you talked about how it would be good to have um, workshops or dialogues or trainings to improve understanding between judges and the representatives of the media about their respective roles and the framework within which they function, which information they can share, which they cannot, what the procedural rules are. As Vice President Tadic said, they're different for the Constitutional Court, where um, an individual judge can never decide on his or her own. So you cannot say that this judge or that judge ruled one way or another. So these are things that can be, I think, corrected through dialogue or through joint trainings. And I think we are, we sort of come back to the guidelines again, which are useful, but we've also talked about possibly making them um, binding and improving them, which brings me to our final panelist, Admir Solyagic, Director of the Secretariat, who will address us on behalf of the HJPC. So thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I would like to thank our friends and partners for inviting me and for organizing this already traditional conference that we've had each year. The president of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council has given you an outline of the activities and challenges faced by the HJPC, and I will try to add to that with um, additional information, and also I want to avoid the risk of repeating what was said um, by the other panelists. The HJPC is aware of the decrease of public trust in the work of the council and of the judiciary as a whole. One of the priorities of its new leadership is to ensure better transparency of our work. Something that's important for me is how predictable the judiciary is and the council is in their work, how clear their decisions are and how predictable they are. I mean primarily the predictability of appointment so that the public can be sure that the best candidate will be appointed, that a judge or prosecutor will or will not be pun punished in disciplinary proceedings, that we have clear decisions, clear reasoning of judicial decisions, as President Tadic said. A lot of attention is really being devoted to this by the new leadership. As for the normative framework and the issue of capacities and implementation of the law on the freedom of access to information. We do have this and it's been provided for. There is staff trained in this area. And of course, those that seek information from us, the reporters, the media, citizens should be the ones to evaluate our work. Are they satisfied with the quality and the scope of the information we provide? What I think is important to point out is that the sessions of the council are open to the public. Uh, they're open to the media. Reporters can come and um, listen to the sessions at the council. However, some issues are still confusing for the public, which of course is to be expected. We've heard from colleagues from Strasbourg, from the UK, they also have ways to overcome these challenges that, that we all face. The Secretariat has provided a Cisco WebEx platform, just like in the UK. So in terms of IT, 
new technologies, the AJPC is not lagging behind. All members of the Council who cannot come to Sarajevo to attend uh, the sessions in person can do so through an online platform. So they can be part of the sessions, of working groups, of standing committees. All of it works remotely through the WebEx platform and and the same platform is available to all judicial institutions. Through our cooperation with donors for years now, we have been working to build the capacities of chief prosecutors and presidents of courts, uh, their capacity for communicating with the media. We've recently had, uh, we've actually had 12 seminars on this topic just this in the past year, is this enough or not enough? Again, it is not for me to judge. Um, the political environment in which the HAPC functions and the constitutional environment, as well as institutional challenges that uh, the Council faces, it is difficult to talk about successes. I assure you there are some, but it is counterproductive to talk about what the justice system has done and is doing in this area. But I think this is a good opportunity to discuss the problems, the challenges that uh, we are facing. We use all channels of communication that are currently available. There is There's nothing that is um, inaccessible to the HAPC, but many things have become obsolete. The guidelines that you've um, mentioned need to be updated. They need to have a different status. Uh, you propose making them binding, but of course this is not up to me. We also have the rules on anonymizing court decisions, and um, this is something that I think is an added value, but the Secretariat has provided through its partners the um, development of an application module for case law. so so that we can have a case law database, essentially. And um, there was resistance. I mean, we had a donor who was not sure about the, wanting to fund this. They said, you have a database of court decisions. Why do you need a case law database? However, with the support of the highest courts and together with the Air Center and the UK Embassy, and with uh, uh, the highest court in courts in Bosnia and Herzegovina. I don't want to announce it now in any more detail. We will have uh, a big announcement to make in September in any case. The reform uh, program of the new HAPC leadership focuses precisely on these issues, how to establish horizontal and vertical dialogue between higher courts, lower courts, when it comes to promoting quality decisions, consistency of jurisprudence so that citizens know that a law applies equally to everyone. And the focus is on quality reasoning of court decisions. Maybe we are making the right decisions. Maybe our decisions are good, but people don't understand what it is we're doing. And that's one of the principles of the reform program of the new leadership. And the new leadership has the support, as far as I can tell, has the support of the professional community and I would really invite all of us to discuss this in the future. We are developing an application module 
which will be made available first to the professional community, courts and prosecutor's offices, then to lawyers and ultimately to the public in Bosnia-Herzegovina. An important issue for HAPC is we have established case law harmonization panels in the um, area of criminal law, civil law and administrative law. We've been working on promoting topics, suggesting topics for the panels to consider. The opinions of the panels, of the case law panels, are not binding, but they do work in the interest of equality uh, before the law and equal access to justice and challenges that we face because of there being no Supreme Court. Now, we know how important transparency is, and I must really insist that we need to look towards ourselves and consider whether we are being clear, whether reporters and citizens can understand uh, what we're doing. A lot has been done in the justice system in terms of reforms, very positive things were achieved for the system and for citizens. I think what the institutional challenges we're facing now, I think we should heed as a warning. We should ensure the continuity and consistency of the work of AJPC. I presented um, my views on reorganizing the work of the AJPC with the public. We've also done a lot of good work with our UK partners, so I'm very um, grateful and proud of the work we've done, but this is just one step towards the objectives that we're discussing today. Thank you, Admir. You've told us about how things functioned in the past year, and I think it's evident that there is room for more work, and we've gone back to the communication strategy and the guidelines for courts. At this point, perhaps I should um, hand the floor over to my co-moderator. I've already received some questions. Maybe I can read them out and then we can do a round of the panelists. One question, quite expected, is about the guidelines, and it is for all courts. Would it be useful, would it be helpful to make the guidelines binding? Another question about the guidelines, should they include instructions for judges on the use of social networks? This is an interesting question. I know that the Supreme Court of the UK has very strict rules um, on, I think that judges cannot use social media under their own name. However, if it turns out that they use them under a pseudonym and that they have somehow um, risk the integrity of the courts, they have disciplinary liability. I mean, new technologies are advancing very rapidly and carry high levels of risk. I'm not sure if this very strict solution is the solution, but I think it some sort of instruction would be needed. I've mentioned that we've also heard from UNICEF with a question about whether courts would be open to working with children, having children learn about court proceedings. And they've also pointed out that this openness of courts would probably also contribute to more reports of crimes where children are victims. And we know that um, these crimes are often underreported. And we have a general question of 
whether you can name the single biggest problem in your view uh, in, commun in the communication of courts and the media. If you could um, single out one thing, what would it be? So I would like to ask the president to perhaps add to this and then we can do a round of discussion with the panelists. Thank you, Bilena. I think it would be perhaps more efficient if we give a round of responses. The question regarding how well our decisions are understood. First instance decisions speak about uh, interference with private property, but the higher you go, the more abstract it becomes. The Supreme Court cannot deliver such decision. The higher the level, the, the ruling is more abstract. And Mr. Tadic, in fact, gave us a good idea to build interaction. I'm speaking about the media. I'm not speaking about uh, those who introduce themselves as such, just mainstream media. Not that somebody should train a journalist. On the contrary, maybe through dialogue, we can in fact arrive at a better solution for understanding those rulings and then present that to the public. I think it would be good if this last step issued the greatest problem. Maybe the presidents of the two largest Supreme Courts in the country could give us their view of what would be the greatest communication problem in the relationship between the Supreme Court and the courts of ordinary jurisdiction. So, Vesna and Vesna, you have the floor. Well, exactly as I proposed, workshops. In that, I thought that would be of help to the media to understand how the judiciary functions. I keep hearing and reading about the judiciary, this and that, but I have to say that we in the Supreme Court of the Federation do work full steam. We do a good job. The journalists have to understand how the judiciary actually works. We have the prosecutors and the courts. They should speak about the judiciary in general. They should speak about the courts and the prosecutor's officers. Even if they think that there are individuals who are not doing a good job, they should name names rather than speak about the judiciary in general. The fundamental principle of the accusatorial system Criminal proceedings are initiated only upon the request of the competent prosecutor and the prosecutor must undertake criminal investigation if there's evidence to that effect. The court cannot do anything if there's no indictment. So I think it's a problem in the reporting and a campaign against courts. Courts work. I was a judge of the basic court for 27 years. I had at least 12 hours of work a day. I went to the Banyaluka District Court. Vesna was with me. She knows exactly what I'm talking about. Again, 12 to 15 hours every day. We've had results. I came to the Supreme Court in the criminal department. Those people come in at 7 and leave at 7 in the evening. We do work full steam. Our standards are high. Our case files are huge. You just can't manage in less time. So I really think that the media need to understand how it all works. They keep speaking about the judiciary. We do work. That's what I wanted to say. We are a society in transition. What does that mean? There's a change of 
ownership, a change of the system. When you ask a citizen, what's the health system like? They'll say bad. When you ask them, what's the, the judiciary like? They'll say very bad. Why should it be any different? We have to work together to show the opposite, to build public trust, to explain that things are not as bad as they may think. Why? Because when speaking about communication between the media and the judiciary, I agree with my colleague, there should be a distinction. What's what in the judiciary? The courts and the prosecutor's offices, Crisis communication is communication with the prosecutor. It's the first information of significance for the public and for the media. When the case comes to court, you can't put it in your drawer. People sometimes speak about cases hidden in somebody's drawers. There's no such possibility. People need to learn to work together to build trust amongst ourselves. Once we do that, then we can change the negative perception in the education system, in the health system. Otherwise, we're undermining ourselves by presenting a negative image of the judiciary, which isn't a good solution. If I was to say something specific regarding communication, of course, the Supreme Court and the judiciary in general are a rigid body that can give only information if it's in compliance with the law. That's what a journalist needs to understand, that the court cannot give information that could perhaps be of importance for a particular case. It may be interesting for the public, but the court cannot because our procedures are formalized if proceedings are underway, there's a there's a limit to the information we can give. We can tell you that there's a case, there are stages of investigation, and the trial, you have to make a distinction between what you can get from the prosecutor's office and what you can get from the court. When speaking about the Supreme Court, again, as Latko said, sometimes our decisions seem to be highly formalized. People don't understand them. We used to give short statements about our decisions, and then people would start interpreting over and over. We now have a new form of communication. We give our entire ruling, judgment, or decision. So they can actually look at the entirety of the decision. There's no need for interpretation. It's in the already in the judgment. Thank you. Maybe it's important to say that we all understand how damaging has it, how damaging it has been for us to introduce this word, the judiciary. It's damaging for the courts. The High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council has its own interest in bringing us together as an inter independent like regulatory body. But the judiciary is the victim of this generalization because when, when they call you an early bird, they will tell you good morning even if it's noon. It's not in our system, and it's not in our mentality, and it's not in our experience or tradition to expect for this system to work. In the UK, there's a tradition of uh, mutual communication between prosecutors and courts. In France, for the first five years of a professional to judiciary, the Minister of Justice assigns them for a year as a prosecutor, a year as a judge, etc. In Italy, there are huge differences between how this is done. Bosnia and Herzegovina was an experiment of sorts. But Mr. Tadic, I know, will have something to add. Thank you. Yes, it's a very interesting topic from different vantage points. But 
just to add to what Mrs. Brath Brathwaite has read as possible questions or issues to consider. Guidelines for judges or prosecutors in social networks, yes. Generally, I wanted to say, motivated by my colleague, uh, Mr. Kaurinovic, about this publication of names of judges or composition of trial chambers. We have a rule that does not allow us to give information on judge rapporteur and uh, um, the clerk working on the case. In the Constitutional Court, there can be no ruling other than administrative taken by the, the president, but a ruling regarding a case, no. Even three judges cannot take it. We have a small chamber. We can only give interim measures, but a judgment can only be in a panel of at least five judges unanimously or by a majority vote if it's uh, the full court. We have that. And that's a decision-making system. No individual can take a ruling. Speaking about courts of ordinary jurisdiction in civil matters, it's all individual judges. In criminal matters, up to 10 years, individual judges, what's the burden borne by that person when somebody publishes their name? A bit less, but very dangerous. It's in a panel, which is what Mr. Kaurinovich mentioned, because a panel is three judges so it's a majority decision two to one. The strictest rules are in the Constitutional Court. We have very strict rules. If we don't have a simple majority vote of nine judges, there's no ruling. So guidelines should be adapted to this. We don't want transparency to be counterproductive. Both presidents said, and we've heard it from others, the understanding of how we work. The president said it well, the higher the level, the abstract, the more abstract the ruling. We have to know that citizens and the media are not equally equipped to interpret and to understand the court ruling, especially when there are complex cases like the ones before uh, Supreme Court, uh, State Court, Constitutional Courts. These are very sophisticated cases where we, we have no rulings that do not refer to rulings of the European Court of Human Rights and some other senior courts like the Constitutional Courts of Germany and Austria, etc. UNICEF and uh, Access for Children, yes. This uh, event organized by Emira and the Court of Bosnia Herzegovina, yes. But in that, we have to adapt to the level of understanding. If they come to the Constitutional Court, it'll be fun for them to see our rooms, but to understand how we work, they can't. We need to adapt to the level of understanding that we can expect. What needs to be done and what we're doing, something that I haven't mentioned that we'll continue to develop is that law students communicate with judicial institutions, including us. Our registrar has a well-organized activity. We allow not only national but also foreign law school students to come and learn about our work this is something that would be very useful something that we need to continue developing let me also go back to better understanding something that we need to work on i'm afraid that this transparency would in fact become counterproductive because it's hard to understand some of those decisions. Communicating full texts of the rulings, yes. Telling people, yes, you just look at it. Giving partial information is subject to interpretation. Bilena did ask a question about negative experiences in communication. 
The President and I talked about this yesterday. There's a query from the media about how individual judges voted in a particular case, even why they voted the way they did. And why that was so. Or oh, they send a query to the President, it's a media outlet, please tell me now, etc. And that's what I had in mind. We need to sit down with them. We need to work with them. It's not a problem, at least in the institution that I come from, for us to be open really as much as we can. But the problem is to understand our openness properly and to convey information properly to the citizens because that's how they build their positions on uh, the judiciary. Again, I go back to this word, the judiciary. As a judge, I've been in all the different uh, offices. I was a prosecutor for a long time. Then many were asking, is that the judiciary? The judiciary, it's the court. It's the courts we're talking about. That's the judicial power. That's the judicial branch. The prosecutor is a party to the proceedings, just like lawyers and others before the court. And that's why we have what we have. And Mr. Knezovic and um, Vesna spoke about this. Everybody, everything comes under this umbrella of the judiciary, which is wrong. There are very good courts. There are excellent results. There are good decisions. And we can speak about this competently because we're the only institution that everybody can address from across the country when it comes to constitutional rights. But at the end, something that is damaging to this good image of the judiciary is slowliness. And this is regarding um, the council trial within reasonable time. That's where we have a lot of problems and numerous violations. We're under such pressure that we really don't know what to do. We've tried to protect the courts as much as possible. And then lawyers do their jobs. They go to Strasbourg. The fact that we don't have a judge, that there's no financing for the position of a judge, they don't care. Then there has to be compensation. And that's why there's a massive number of applications. And you look at the rulings coming. It's a short two-page ruling. And then Annex gives you 15 other applications, and they say, apply the same ruling to all this. I'm inviting the High Judiciary and Prosecutorial Council to do something about this, to eliminate this problem uh, as soon as possible. I'm happy to see that Republika Srpska does have this law on trial within reasonable time. I'm also grateful to the Batko district for adopting such a law. And it's in fact better than the one in the Republika Srpska. If you analyze it, Vesna is confirming this is an excellent piece of legislation. And I regret that the Federation hasn't done this. The Court of Bosnia and Herzegovina doesn't have it yet, but there are fewer problems. Most of the problems are in the Federation. And Sarajevo, Tuzla, Mostar, these are the three courts with the biggest problem. There's a lot less in the Republika Srpska, but Ko has almost nothing maybe two decisions in the past 10 years thank you thank you mr tadic very briefly regarding some other elements the students we in the constitutional court signed memoranda with uh, the leading law schools we offered this to some others. Only the law school in Tuzla, thanks to Mr. Mahmutovic, who was the, the dean and the rector of the University of Tuzla, he tried to implement part of that memorandum with the Constitutional Court and the law school in Sarajevo, partly. Other law schools simply didn't show any interest. It's strange that even before the pandemic, 
We had about 10 visits per year by law schools from across Europe. From Italy, there are two universities who come regularly. They send students, they even doctorals have doctoral students every three months from the UK, from Moldova, Romania. Regular visits and law schools in Bosnia and Herzegovina rarely. And another thing regarding guidelines and the composition of the trial chamber is a key question. What's the public interest in knowing the composition of a first instance trial chamber or a second instance one? I'm not speaking about curiosity, but what's the public interest? There's a rule. Several years ago, I was at a meeting where a former constitutional court judge said, rapporteur in a case and this colleague did not respond and he started and I interrupted and I said the Constitutional Court has a rule never ever can judges say who was the judge rapporteur in a particular case even if it's themselves this is to protect the dignity of the court the former judge didn't like it, the moderator didn't like it, because they had their own idea about um, introductions. So what is the public interest? And before we finish, let me ask Emira and Admir, Mrs. Hodric and Mr. Suljagic, that is, if they would like to add something in this um, section. As for the guidelines, I think it would be useful for all the courts to make these guidelines mandatory because all the courts have an obligation to publish their rulings. And I think that this um, uniform set of rules would be useful for everybody so that we have a uniform practice. As for social networks, I think, in the atmosphere, in the society at the moment, I think that would be counterproductive. We've just talked about how the media report and this major transparency can in fact become counterproductive. Unfortunately, people simply don't have the culture of communication, so I think it would be a public lynching opportunity for the courts unless it was strictly prescribed through a uniform set of rules and to keep it under control, under tight control, rather than causing damage and then trying to undo the damage, removing comments, etc. So I think we need to think carefully about whether to consider using social uh, media as for visits and children we've had such a visit of course we adapted the content to their age group it was like a performance in the court we have a witness support unit with psychologists who actually supported us in that and they gave us practical advice on how to communicate with children so i think that this can be organized quite easily to make it interesting for the children, and they do have some idea about what a court does. As for students visiting, I do share the opinion expressed by President Knezhevich regarding law schools in Bosnia. There's no major interest, particularly of law schools. We've had visits from other universities. There are some that come regularly, but also we've had visits by foreign students, even groups who come in as tourists and then use the opportunity, who are lawyers or psychologists, also interested in our witness support unit, or we have uh, former international judges recommending to their colleagues to come and visit the court. Thank you. If I can add something to this, hearing about the Constitutional Court and the Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Human resources 
are important in our Supreme Court of Republika Srpska we have limited human resources we have uh, all full staffing and we have two judges who haven't been working for the past two years so again human resources are the basis for good work good communication of any court including this Supreme Court and any other court of ordinary jurisdiction as Mr. Tadic mentioned we have rulings almost daily about excessive deadlines it's about human resources we don't have the number of judges that we need we have five additional positions that we haven't filled because we don't have the financing and we don't have the offices the premises to accommodate those people even if we had the money we have three and a half thousand cases in the administrative department we keep planning to deal with old cases and trying to the judges are dealing with you know it's um 25 percent upon receipt 25 percent by date of receipt but we just can't manage that many cases the backlog we have a huge backlog and a huge number of cases coming in speaking about uh, publication of the composition of uh, panels when a lawyer opens the um, court management system if there's a scheduled uh, hearing they see the judge we indicate who is chairing the panel who the panel members are it is publicly available this year but I see Vesna doing the same thing I published the roster of the judges and the panel so everything is public as when you see the judge you know the panel when it comes to the guidelines courts don't do it the same way some anonymize some do not anonymize entirely most courts only give statements which are usually incomplete and that's why journalists um, are left with a lot of room, not for misinformation, but I think that when a judgment is vacated, there should be a statement immediately explaining why a judgment was vacated. These are serious violations of criminal procedure codes or civil procedure codes. It's no secret. We need to say it out loud that everybody should know why a judgment was vacated rather than giving them an opportunity to write all kinds of misconceptions. There is still a, court, a case that has had judgments abolished twice. It's a case of interest to the public. I don't need to name the case. The journalists have written all kinds of things. First, that we had a sabotage, a diversion. Judgments were vacated on the basis of serious procedural violations. We simply could not move on. Then I made a statement and I said these are serious violations because of which we had to vacate the first instant judgments and send it to a retrial. Excuse me, because of Zoom and those who are with us online, we have a time restriction. So, well, I'm done. I've said what I wanted to say. As for visits, I just support it, that's all. Courts that can provide such a service, I support it. For me, the most important is trial within reasonable time let's not open that debate but maybe it's for a different event budget planning capacity planning the real needs of the court the real structure of the court that's something that presidents of the courts depend on we've we've outgrown our own structures we depend on individuals who 
have completed uh, primary school and the typing course. Judges keep um, speaking about court reporters. We can't work with typists, but we can't go into that now. Budget planning, budget execution, that's what we need to look at. We need to look at audit office reports when it comes to budget planning for courts and for prosecutors' offices. But again, this is something that we should prepare as a, a topic for a different conference because it's important. Of course, we need an adequate number of judges, not just that an adequate number. There's other support staff that we need for the court to be able to respond to its task. As for the mandatory nature of the guidelines, yes, I do agree. I absolutely agree. The guidelines should be mandatory for web page publication, for database, uh, for the database of judgments, to keep it unified. The professional community, together with the council, must be uh, able to respond to this, and this is something we need to uh, stick to. When it comes to stricter rules in the UK and public statements by judges and prosecutors, the use of uh, media, modern media, yes, I think that there should be stricter rules about that with due respect. A judge and the prosecutor cannot just uh, give personal opinions on Facebook or Twitter. A responsible expression of one's opinion. If people say, I think, people understand that they know what they have in mind. That's our problem in the judiciary with the public. People have these opinions of the judiciary, and in most cases, it's just not true. But that's what people think. But these are some new to topics. As for UNICEF, we do have cooperation with them, and where children are involved in cases, we also have rooms for children to be comfortable before they testify, etc. We organized visits for secondary schools. We work with law schools to major events within a Swiss where crime doesn't pay and thieves get caught. Maybe you've missed it, but we had two major uh, promotion campaigns to promote the work of the prosecutors, etc. Maybe I failed to mention, but I think we've already exceeded our time. Not only that, but also because of uh, Mr. Vehabovic, who also has other commitments and he needs to speak to us soon. He's on a tight schedule. We've already talked about all of this. The next panel will be the reverse. We'll listen what the other side, the media, think about our conduct to see what is it in our own behavior that is a problem for them or that leads us to a negative? So we'll take a five minute break. No, 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 no. There's a longer break. We'll take a 15 minute break. This maximum because there's coffee outside. Well, it's okay. You speak at 12.35. 12.35. So 15 minutes. Thank you. Excellent. We can continue. We will be talking about uh, public access to the judicial system. We'll have a panel discussion. We have an introductory speaker, Fadis Vehabovic, a judge at the European Court of Human Rights. Welcome. Thank you. I'd like to thank the organizers for organizing this important forum regarding a topic that I think is very important and I think is one of the main problems when it comes to understanding the role of the 
judicial system and the role of the media in presenting the work of the systems, as well as the relationship between media and courts. To start off with, I'd like to say something about the practice of public access to um, proceedings, court proceedings from the experience of the European Court of Human Rights and the EU Court of Justice, as well as um, the Constitutional Court in Bosnia. But I do want to say something about um, what was said during the first panel, because I think these issues are in many ways related. In terms of the public nature of court proceedings, of course, it is a key element of every modern democratic society that contributes to a fair hearing. So the public nature ensures the fairness of the trial. And this is particularly important in criminal matters where the accused must have the right to a public hearing. Transparency in the justice system increases efficiency and effectiveness and promotes trust in the justice system. It also encourages judges to act fairly and impartially and independently. The transparency of court proceedings is based on the right to information and the legal basis is also based is also governed by the right of the public to be informed about proceedings court proceedings this includes access to hearings and case files and this is one of the manifestations of the right to information. However, there are some exceptions and restrictions can be imposed under certain circumstances. For example, when uh, proceedings involve investigating corruption, matters of national security, privacy, and the protection of rights of children and juveniles. Public court proceedings are also a means to maintain trust in courts. Publicity is also related to the transparency of court activities. Therefore, public access to court documents is an important element of judicial transparency that promotes fair trials. There is also a reverse relationship whereby procedural rights ensure a fair trial, but also contribute to transparency. When it comes to examples from the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights, we can see two different approaches to this topic. On the one hand, the European Court of Justice is, as an example of closed court, the, the proceedings are closed even to parties in the proceedings. They're closed to the public in terms of the availability of court documents and arguments that they use to base their decisions on. And on the other end, we have the European Court of Human Rights, which is the very opposite, it takes the opposite approach and um, offers information on proceedings underway and especially proceedings that have been concluded. The European Court of Justice has faced a serious criticism of its judgments being politically motivated. And this is very similar to what we hear in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And that for the EU Court of Justice, that they're too integrative um, for the taste of some member state. By openly disclosing um, case files, all the facts of the case and arguments of the 
sides and the proceedings would be one way to respond to the criticism. Um, the issue of whose arguments have an actual influence on the interpretations of the European Courts of Justice is a matter that is difficult to ascertain without having access to the documents of the court. If we had public access to documents that shape the decisions or in which the decisions of the judges are based, then they could respond to this criticism. Otherwise, their work lacks transparency. A number of human rights documents guarantee these rights, uh, primarily Article 6 of the European Convention, which says that everyone has the right to a fair and public hearing. Article 14 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights it says that anyone accused has the right to a fair and public hearing. Article 47 of the Treaty of Fundamental Rights of the EU also guarantees the right to a fair and open hearing. Now, the public nature of hearings have been interpreted as synonymous with a with an oral hearing the european court of justice views it as such in isolation so when we compare the approaches of these two european courts in terms of public access to hearings and documents we can arrive at a number of conclusions. There is a large difference between the EU Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights in terms of how they enable public access to their documents so that the European Court of Human Rights has very strong openness of um, court proceedings ever since 1998, while the EU Court of Justice has a very conservative attitude towards public access to its document, pointing out the equality of arms. The conservative position of the EU Court of Justice is based on the French legal tradition. So they have also the descending opinion of judges, the minimalist style of reasoning, the um, public defender, etc. And this tradition of being closed has been maintained to date. The European Court of Justice, however, has put itself in an absurd situation where its decisions have ordered EU authorities to enable public access to documents, to their documents, while on the other hand, not allowing access to case files and case and court documents. And this is an absurd situation. It brings into question compliance with Article 6 and 10 of the European Convention because the European Court of Human Rights has ruled that public access to court documents falls within the scope of Article 10 of the European Convention. Now, any comment of court decisions has to be exclusively based on arguments and not on political positions that are being promoted. Courts that um, have a closed approach to the public actually create room for incomplete information or unavailable information, only partial information, uh, to be used to produce attitudes 
that are not argued or not based on the arguments that the courts themselves used in making their decisions. We must also note that the legal tradition of protecting human rights is completely different in these two um, systems where the European Court of Human Rights has a long-standing case law on protecting individual rights, the European Court of Justice mainly has the principle of stopping proceedings at the national level until a case is resolved at the European Court of Justice and then proceedings are resumed at the national level. And this difference in tradition, in the approach, in the practice and case law of these two courts has, uh, it seems, led to divergent practices which, um, which are significantly different but also reflect today's approaches to this topic at the European level. The European Court of Human Rights, here we have a well-established case law setting out rules saying that non-disclosure of uh, um, evidence of the defense can be balanced out with other procedural measures. So, for example, a court decision to extend custody cannot be decisively based on uh, materials that are not publicly available. So an individual cannot be made subject to measures that restrict his rights um, partly or completely based on documents that are closed, or that are not disclosed to the public or disclosed to the other side. The court has also pointed out that the, the parties must have access to all the essential arguments used in the proceedings. However, as of lately, the European Court of Human Rights has also derogated from this essential requirement of disclosing arguments. So in cases of Ghulam Hussein and Tariq versus the UK and Regner versus the Czech Republic, as is the case in most well, in most derogations from case law, the focus has shifted from Article 6 by balancing national security with the right to a fair trial, whereby the European Court, as I said, made a significant step backwards. We should reiterate always that courts have to be open to the public through external communication, through transparent public hearings, by making sure that um, information that does not bring into a question procedural rights or the essence of procedural rights are made publicly available. In this way, courts help themselves, they help their image, their public image, and the decisions they make enjoy the trust of the public. Unfortunately, this is rarely the case. Courts are very often closed, their proceedings are closed, and the image that they send out to the world is one that they do not participate in by their own volition. This is detrimental to the rights of parties to proceedings and the interests of the public to receive, as far as possible, information and prevent misinterpretations in the public arena in Bosnia-Herzegovina. An example of openness in Bosnia-Herzegovina is the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina, which in its activities makes available arguments to both sides. Because the rule is to exhaust domestic uh, remedies, so documents 
used in the proceedings before the European Court of Human Rights and the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina were mostly available to the public beforehand. On the other hand, documents before the Constitutional Court are open to a certain degree to public access and people can consult the documents based on which the court makes its decision, not to mention the actual communication between the parties to the proceedings where the constitutional court, as is usual, allows access by all parties to the proceedings to all the arguments so that they may respond. Something that isn't a copy of European uh, court case law is uh, having public hearings. There are very few public hearings. They're more of an exception than a rule at the Constitutional Court. And the manner of communication, which is quite um, obsolete since the time when I worked at the Constitutional Court as a registrar, I think it's been 15, well, more like 17 or 18 years. And in that time, the social environment, the communication environment has changed significantly. And this really should have been reflected in um, technologies that could have contributed to the transparency of the court uh, not just through its, uh, not just to continue using press releases, but despite all of this, the Constitutional Court is still a good example of openness to the public and openness to the media. The Constitutional Court, uh, some 17 or 18 years ago, was the first um, judicial institution to introduce an open day for the media as a way to achieve what was discussed at the previous panel. The purpose was to educate the media, to introduce a degree of specialization among reporters, to have individual reporters become specialized for following and reporting on court proceedings and understanding what the courts do and how different levels uh, of courts adopt decisions and how they act in public space. With greater transparency, we reduce room for, for manipulation of court proceedings, and that should be the objective of all of us within the justice system and of the media and of the public at large. As for the discussions from the previous panel, there was the issue of who is responsible for the negative image of the justice system. It's certainly not the media. I think blame has to be sought precisely in this system, the justice system, judiciary, whatever you call it, but this this is a closed system, this way of reasoning where what the court does is difficult to understand for ordinary people, for ordinary citizens. I think that is the basic reason um, for the poor image and lack of understanding. The general public, of course it's important, not just parties to proceedings, but when we talk about the possibility of making information available just to parties to the proceedings, I think that would lead to closing the court system, creating an impression of self-sufficiency instead of openness and transparency, which should be our objective. And I think 
that is one of the main causes behind the poor image of our judicial system among the public. When it comes to disclosing the composition of judges' panels and decision-making procedures, I think that if a judge is not ready to accept his name being included on a decision that he has made, then he could hardly expect to pass the test that would have to be mandatory of judges, which is to have the strength of character to withstand any kind of external pressure, even when he makes a decision that is not popular with the public. And I think this should be one of the main postulates for holding judicial office. Of course, on the other hand, there is this problem that I've already mentioned, which is that the media share some of the blame and creating this poor image with the wholehearted support from a very closed court system, which I understand lacks the financial resources to hire additional staff that would be specialized for communicating, for public communication, either through social media or by enabling webcasting or video streaming of public hearings. This would be one way to ensure access to anyone to participate as a viewer in a court hearing. And in some cases, this would be of tremendous importance, not just for the public, but primarily for the courts themselves and for creating a positive image of transparency. And this would prevent speculation about decisions being made for this or that political or any other interest. All of these questions would be laid to rest in a sense because everything would be visible and clear uh, if you were able to view uh, the public hearings. Thank you. Thank you, Colin Pichabovic. Thank you for pointing out what we have at the level of Europe. We have a different approach. Of course, the EU course in Luxembourg is a course of a very narrow supranational um, organization. We will not have an opportunity to participate in its work, unfortunately, but um, the European Court of Justice, I think, has judges from uh, 47 or 48 member states, and all of them have to achieve a common standard under the European Convention. So thank you for these remarks and for, for these examples. I know that it is easier when you, I personally know that it's easier when you comment from the position of the highest court and you tell your colleagues at lower courts that they need to be more open. Of course, judges from basic or um, municipal or district courts have a different um, we have a different perspective. We, um, as uh, judges at the Constitutional Court, we have to write a reasoning for all of our decisions. We cannot have the registrar simply say that um, your application will not be considered because or there were decisions where reasoning was left out as being superfluous, for example. This is how things used to be done before. So thank you again, Mr. Vehab, which is always inspiring to hear from you. We are moving on to the second part of um, to the second panel. 
something that we wanted to do. Um, we have reporters organize conferences to talk with each other, judges organize conferences to talk with each other, then uh, prosecutors do the same, and then, you know, the international community has its own conference. We now wanted to speak with colleagues from the media, and they will be telling us the problems that they face in the justice system when they are trying to do their job. So today, just, sorry, just the court system, if we can focus on the court system um, and exclude prosecutor's offices, I would like to welcome our participants. Ms. Anila Sokol, a politically correct gendered noun, research and project coordinator of Media Center Sarajevo. Colleague Denis Didic, director of BIRN, the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network. Yelena Radovic Kapor, editor of the news program of the public broadcaster. Vildana Salimbegovic, Editor-in-Chief of Oslo Bodjene, The Daily, Sandra Gojkovic Arbutina, the Editor-in-Chief of Nezavis Nenovne, and Drago Ljubirelic, Director of the Agency for the Protection of Personal Data. Dr. Ljubirelic is here that when we speculate on what is uh, protection of uh, private privacy or personal data, what are European standards, that he can tell us, yes, you are right, or no, you are wrong, and this is the interest that needs to be protected. So, we have a um, limited time slot. Uh, however, the judges didn't really stick to them. I don't expect you to stick to the five minutes either, but I would like to ask Ms. Sokol to present us with the uh, research findings of Media Center. Thank you. I think we're fine sitting down. Yeah, I'm sticking to the armchair. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure for me to talk about transparency at today's forum. In the Media Center, We wanted to see when the pandemic started last year, how the institutions in Bosnia Herzegovina responded to offer timely and accurate information to the public. We looked at uh, crisis boards communication, i.e., crisis communication. The media and the journalists complained about uh, lack of access, lack of timely access to information that the information was contradictory quite often, that crisis board representatives uh, were not responding to their queries. And after that, we also wanted, in consultation with um, uh, Air Center, we wanted to see how the judicial institutions responded to the crisis. We were particularly interested in the initial period from March until May last year how the judicial institutions communicated with the media, how they published information about their work. And we know that there were some restrictive measures. Most hearings were deferred. Judicial institutions had to organize work from home. And then how they offered information to the public. So. We followed um, announcements by 10 different institutions at different levels in Bosnia. You know, we conducted interviews with uh, spokespersons and representatives of judicial institutions, as well as lawyers. Let me just give you the key conclusions that we arrived at. First, the pandemic was an extraordinary situation. It continues to be an extraordinary situation. And it's understandable that it was difficult to take certain decisions, particularly initially, however, despite the communication challenges that existed, particularly 
because hearings were deferred. In major cases, judicial institutions continued to communicate in the same way as they did in the past. I think this was mentioned at the beginning of this uh, forum. There's uneven practice, particularly because they have excellent spokespersons. Judicial institutions' communication depends on the professionalism and attitudes of the spokespersons. Others are closed for the public. There were some problems as present, uneven publication, particularly on the Pravo Sujepa webpage, which is often difficult to access to obtain information. Guidelines from 2014 regarding publication of court rulings are not applied. Most institutions don't apply those guidelines, and despite the fact that those are good guidelines, but they're not uh, binding, that's what brings us to this situation. Then communication often depended, as I said, on the spokespersons themselves, how accommodating they are. Some of them did work from home too, but journalists were also complaining about the fact that spokespersons and per simply didn't know the law on freedom of access to information adequately, didn't apply it. So it always depended on the actual individual working at the judicial institution. Also, they complained that anonymization of personal information in the publications. And finally, after talking to journalists and examining all this, we wanted to see how the media, how the media reported, and of course, the main conclusions, as we said at the beginning, we need a strategic approach, a communication strategy at the level of the High Judicial Prosecutorial Council that would be binding for everybody, a comprehensive communication strategy that would explain in detail the role of certain judicial representatives, how to hold a press conference during the pandemic. Very few of them actually had any press conferences. Also, guidelines that we've mentioned quite a bit today, perhaps specify and make them binding. Another thing is training. A lot of shortcomings on both sides. So. What the judge said, on one hand, everybody's blaming the media. On the other hand, everybody's blaming the judicial institutions. I think, because I'm not from either side, I'm a researcher in the media center, perhaps both are to blame to an extent. However, transparency of the judicial institutions is key. Training, training spokespersons, training journalists so they can specialize in court cases or judicial issues, they can report from the judiciary, especially we know how difficult the situation is in the media, financially in particular, I know my colleagues will mention that, it's difficult to specialize. And then monitoring, this research was conducted, but it's just one research covering 10 judicial institutions. It's even outdated by now, because so much time has elapsed. We have to have constant monitoring of transparency of the judiciary with an organization to deal with that so that things can move forward. If we only conduct one research, I don't think that's enough. We need to have proper ongoing monitoring, focusing on transparency of the judicial institutions. Thank you. Thank you. How can we access this report, your research, for those who don't know? Yes, I think all the participants have received this report. It's also on the Air Center and the Media Center Sarajevo. Thank you, Mr. Denitich. Thank you. 
Let me say that it will be challenging to speak about transparency or lack of transparency in relation to the judiciary without addressing the challenges that the journalists uh, experience when communicating with the judiciary, particularly the prosecutor of Bosnia and Herzegovina. I think I understand there's a clear differentiation between courts and prosecutors' offices, but they're so connected. So we shouldn't really separate these two issues. Generally, it's more difficult when it comes to the media and the prosecutor's offices. It does cause a lot of controversy and some kind of uh, antagonism. This antagonism is now evident in numerous public statements you see by representatives of the judiciary placing the blame for the public perception about the situation of the judiciary, addressing, assigning it to the media. And this is becoming harsher unless we address these problems soon, irrespective of the numerous positive processes and the situation that is perhaps not as bad as some may think that in some prosecutor's offices there aren't that many problems that public confidence will be almost non-existent. This is just uh, by way of introduction. When it comes to this issue of transparency, particularly during the COVID pandemic and cooperation with the media, it's hard to speak after Anida and her research because these are the crucial parts. I'll just mention some of the things. Huge problems. One regarding interpretation of different courts about how to submit a free access to, inf to information request requesting the journalists to bring those requests in person, to put a stamp on them, to explain why they need the information, which is absolutely not according to the law. I think in a number of cases, this is done unintentionally. This is mainly out of ignorance. But in some cases, we've seen targeted use of such obstacles so that the 15-day deadline, which is too long for journalists, when they're preparing daily reports, then this time extends. The journalist will appeal, then it takes time. It drags us to up to a month, and it's no longer a relevant story. Pretending that this is just ignorance is just not true. And I think we need to address this maybe as a disciplinary issue when we established that there was a deliberate attempt to make unlawful requests. As for guidelines and anonymization, I do agree that the biggest problem is that guidelines are not binding. That means that persons who are sentenced for identical crimes, war crimes, before the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina their judgments will forever be publicly available with their full names, whereas persons sentenced for the same crime before a district court in Banja Luka or Priedor, confirmed by the Supreme Court of Republika Srpska. Nobody will know their names because judgments will be anonymized. That creates problems for the media, for the researchers trying to collect such data. So this is really a problematic practice when it comes to equality before law. And it's really something that does create a lot of problems for the journalists when working on certain stories. In daily communication, as my colleague said, it really depends on the person who is the spokesperson, the public relations persons. In some cases, it's court secretaries who have this as their third or fourth duty. But it really depends on how understanding those persons are for media queries and how interested they are in dealing with them properly and timely. What I wanted to add to what my colleague has already said is a big problem in uneven practice regarding audio and video materials from the courts at trials. So 
we have a situation which I believe others know about that after the first ruling was uh, adopted about anonymizing judgments and the recommendations were issued dealing with submission of audio and video materials from court. So as of then, you simply could not obtain full audio or video CDs or DVDs from trials. You couldn't uh, publish anything. We're speaking about public hearings. We're not speaking about hearings that are closed to the public for whatever valid reason. They only give us the first 10 minutes, which then creates an uneven treatment of journalists who work for print media and those who work for electronic media because uh, Detector Bar, I'm in the courtroom, I can write whatever I want, I can articulate my text as I want, my colleague from BHT, they need four minutes of report, a news item, they don't have the clucking uh, excerpts, they don't have witness statements, they don't have key elements they need for the report, she is forced to read a voiceover, and then somebody tells her it's boring. That's basically unequal treatment of two journalists, and in view of the fact that in Bosnia, most people obtain their information from the electronic media, this attitude, this relationship is not good. When you go from state level down to entity level in the Brčko district, again, there's um, inequality. In some cases, videotaping is okay, in some it's not. The way video of the issue of videotaping and taking photographs, in some courts, if you come with a camera, the judge will decide on whether you can actually tape anything, whereas if you come with a photo camera, if you want to take photos for the text, the question will be to the accused whether he agrees to that. So you have colleagues asking the cameraman to do screenshots and uh, stills to have a photo. These are unclear rules which I think need to be addressed by the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council. They should have binding instructions that would then resolve all these issues and create equality so that the journalists know exactly what they can and should obtain and that those rules are the same in all the courts at all the levels and for all the press be it from electronic media or from print media or for online media and let me conclude with a problem that we're generally confronted with when it comes to transparency an example before the court of bosnia herzegovina a fantastic initiative because of the covid in one case after the ventilator story they decided because not all the press could enter they wanted to offer an online version there was a link for the media to follow a live stream from the trial there was a similar initiative in the us Traditionally, they're quite close to that, so you have no photographs. After a murder that launched a global Black Lives Matter movement at the protest, there, even the American court decided that the trial should be available through a live streaming here. There was this positive process, but it was only for a few weeks, and after that it was withdrawn because of certain technical problems. But the question is, honestly, for me, there's a dilemma. How come those technical capacities could not, find, not work all of a sudden after working properly for such a long time? And then the question is, because we know how much the donor community participates in the judicial reform, the fact that there's no money for such technical problems uh, quickly, how relevant is such an excuse and how valid is it? I think it's a matter of a lack of interest 
on the part of the judiciary to do things like this, to make them systemically available to a large number of citizens through the media, first and foremost, but also for the citizens directly, just like the European Court does or the Hague Tribunal, where as an individual, you can tap into the live stream of any court proceedings you may be interested in. Let me stop here. I'd like to maintain my five minutes. I'll be happy to answer questions later. Well, you haven't observed your five minutes, but that's okay. It's interesting to hear about this. I'm not defending anybody about technical issues and donations, but when I asked, because we only had 10,000 this year for investment, we wanted to use our catering fund to use it for Cisco or Zoom Professional. The Ministry of Finance rejected this reallocation of funds. I'm not defending anybody. I'm just explaining how it happens. Ms. Yelena Radovich Kapor, she's the editor of News and Currents Affairs for BHTV. Thank you. It's an honor to be here to talk about problems that are basically the same for all of us. And it'll be difficult for me to say something new, something that my colleagues haven't already mentioned. All our problems are more or less the same. It's important to say that the media and the judicial system are not on different sides. It should be in everybody's interest to be a corrective to all the deviant behaviors we have in the society. But the media needs information. If we want to receive official information, we're asking official institutions to give us official information. And then they give us this restricted statement of three sentences. You said stick to judicial institutions, but I'm taking the prosecutor's office as an example. There's a news item on their page. It literally says, the decision to stop the investigation number so-and-so is no longer in force in relation to five person, and there'll be a new investigation. In the rest, appeals have been rejected as unfounded in relation to nine persons, persons and one was rejected as inadmissible. I think you, judicial professionals, understand this, but for the general public, this particular news item is really no news. Let's not even go into how understandable it is. Although you have specific terminology, what you and we must bear in mind is that in public presentations, this needs to be adapted so that what you say is in fact clear to the general public, not just your professional community. My colleague mentioned a technical aspect, which is a problem for us. Technicalities online, Streaming would, was a good idea, but it was short-lived, unfortunately. Sending footage, sending 10 minutes from the beginning of the hearing for us is not good because we have nothing that would be interesting for the public, something that is newsworthy. Maybe an example of best practice is ICTY in The Hague because they had live telecasts from courtrooms with a half hour delay. Better communication would also happen through press conferences. There doesn't have to be an occasion, but a periodic press conference allowing you to summarize your work in a given period. For us, that would give the room and the time to ask some more questions. Let me talk about the other side of the same story, the media. I'm speaking about the problems of news and current affairs programs of the BH TV. When we decide what to follow, be it the judicial system or any other event, what we're guided by is the interest of the public. What I can indicate as our shortcoming is that the judiciary is often reported upon as a news item. It's an edited statement without any real analysis or additional explanations. Also, another problem is that there's no continuity in monitoring a particular case or 
Several reporters follow the same case. That impacts the quality of reporting. Another problem is an insufficient number of reporters. So we simply cannot speak about journalists who are specialized in any area, including the judiciary. And to end, let me mention the importance of training. It's important to train journalists about how to report about judicial institutions. It's also important to train professionals in the judicial institutions. First, that we understand each other, that we understand how we work and function. And then we'll come to what I mentioned, the terminology that we understand what's happening so that the public would understand us perfectly. So that's my briefest explanation. Thank you very much. You're absolutely right. Very few of us in the system have had any opportunity to go through any kind of training, even short, let alone serious training. We use the terminology that is often old-fashioned, I won't even say conservative, but yes. But thank you once again. We're slowly coming to the conclusion what can perhaps be resolved easily, what may require a bit more. Let me ask Mrs. Vildana Selimbegovic, Editor-in-Chief of Oslobodzien, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me to shake things up a shake things up a bit i will be speaking as the guilty party for the poor image of our judicial system i do feel that i am to blame given that i have very often written about the fundamental issues i wish it was just a matter of communication or miscommunication i think we have to start from the essential we have politicized media and a politicized judicial system. This is what has caused serious conflict in society. I'm someone who has been saying for years, not just in my texts, but at um, forums and meetings and conferences throughout the world that without improving the quality of our court systems or our justice system, we have little to hope for. I think the justice system is the foundation and to offer us the possibility of a more decent society. Judge Vehabovic mentioned modern modes of communication. I already imagined our um, judicial staff on um, social networks still having it out having their arguments i don't think the fundamental problem of our courts is clo being closed i think the essential problem is that they are well way too open to be quite honest journalists receive information that have caused the biggest scandals, it doesn't matter if they are grounded in truth or not, some of them will actually end up as court cases of their own, but reporters receive this information from prosecutors' offices that we're not allowed to discuss today, but everyone knows what we think, and from the staff working at courts, where we should be aware this is not being done selectively or non-selectively as we've been talking about that uh, that they, they are selective in terms of print media non-print media no they have their own reporters they have political connections they have loyal media and they provide this information through social media and modern communication means to make sure that the scandal has a wide reach. I am an editor in a uh, media outlet that has very conservative standards and we seem a little bit obsolete because I still cannot accept this modern reporting principles where one month we are in favor of one side and then 
on for one day, we let someone from the other side of the story have their say in our features, in our stories, Oslo Bedenje insists, and also we have reporters specialized for um, the court system. We insist that our articles show all sides every single time. And when we do not receive information from a judicial institution, I insist that this has to be written down in the text because that is information in and of itself. It's not a problem to set up better communication. I mean, of course, there's ample room for improvement. We could reach a European level if we were a different society, but we know where we live. We know that our society is divided along very firm, unfortunately, very firm ethnic lines. And we have also conflicting publics. I'm very proud of the fact that I work for a media outlet that continues to ignore such things and which is why we have an opportunity to show the opinions and the attitudes for example we have a column from uh, one of the judges of the uh, district course of banya luka his columns are very widely read. This is a way for the media to open their space to people who know what they're talking about. I know there's a terminology problem often, but you know what? When Judge Branko Peric writes a book or a column, as far as I know, the whole world understands him. So I don't think there are any great miscommunications. I mean, we can agree with certain positions or not, but that is as it should be in a democracy. These are matters for discussion everywhere, except here. Here we treat them as problems. With complete rampant politicization that we need to rescue the justice system from and the media from. Thank you, Vildana. Sometimes I think it's beneficial to have someone point out the um, other side and uh, the ugly side of things that I think it's good that we all understand each other here. I would like to ask Sandra Gojkovic Arbutina, the editor in chief of Nezavisne Novine Daily. Thank you, Vildana, and I are among the media outlets that share certain postulates. So we have a team of people um, at Nezavisne Novine. We have a number of reporters devoted exclusively to the justice system and these topics. I think media that have been working for a long time do make sure that they have specialized and trained reporters. I think it's important also what uh, Vildana said about Mr. Peric, who also wrote for us. The problems that he encountered when he was publishing articles in Nezavisne Novine, uh, I think you all know about, he was held, uh, he had to go through disciplinary proceedings. He, I tried to make sure that his columns don't um, have hate speech or something inside. You've heard from my colleagues about the basic functioning of media. But I wanted to t tell you an example from Banja Luka. I recent, I'm the only representative from Banja Luka here. I've sat with colleagues who have been following the justice system for 20 years now to hear what their biggest issues are. 
there's a situation where <clears throat> when they know that there's a case of great public interest and they know that there's going to be a lot of media present, they try to make sure they get the smallest room in the court to make sure that not all of the media can bring their cameras in. Or, for example, what Dennis mentioned that you can you can have a, you can make video but not photos or the other way around. Um, whenever you have a hearing, you have to write a separate request to access it. If hearings are public, why do we have to request access each single time? Why do we have to request uh, permission to take photographs? But Wildana has also mentioned some much more serious problems that I think we need to take into account. My colleagues have pointed out, especially that we will have to, well, one of the, our biggest problems, and this does concern prosecutors' offices as well, the media are not the only ones with an interest. We've heard that it's the media's fault that the judicial system has such a poor image. We are behind the between the public and the justice system. So we're not just representing the interest of the media, but also the interest of the public. And this, I think, is where we misunderstand each other. Um, the justice system seems to think, judiciary seems to think that when something is the interest of the media, it is not the interest of the public, and that couldn't be further from the truth. I want to say on behalf of Nezavis Nenovina and colleagues from Banja Luka, is that definitely here in Bosnia Herzegovina, and I'm sure I'm speaking on behalf of everyone here, that media feel unprotected, very much left out to dry. The judiciary does not take into account attacks on the media. There was a drastic case recently. My colleague Radimir Kovacevic, he was beaten up by thugs who, well, well it's actually was attempted murder, but who were the people who ordered these, who commissioned the act? And never mind the ones who committed it. Who is it who ordered the beating of Vladimir Kovacevic nearly to death. There was a lot of pressure of the public to find the thugs who beat him, but those issuing the orders have not been apprehended, and we all have the same experience of this. We've had death threats um, six months ago. Nothing was done about it. We don't have an environment where we can feel free where we can feel protected, that we know that once we get to the court, the court will take into account the specific nature of our job. Another thing that we're all facing, I have the 2018 decision here of the Constitutional Court. We are often um, prosecuted for libel, etc. And there were media that ha went bankrupt, where the media had to prove that something is libel. So for example, we are held liable for emotional pain. So in, in 2018, the Constitutional Court, this was a case of press of Republika Srpska. This was a medium that no media outlet that doesn't exist anymore. For us, this is one of the most important judgments, but no other court has ever taken it into account. With this appellation to the Constitutional Court, it said that the Plaintiff must prove that something is liable, not the media. This is courts, court proceedings cost. Maybe Oslo Bodenia can pay these costs, but smaller media, independent media cannot. The Constitutional Court said that the plaintiff, the pro prosecutor claiming libel must prove that something was slander or libel. However, this has never been applied in the practice of any other court. We still have to keep proving that something is the truth 
instead of the person suing us having to prove why something that we printed was a lie. So this is where we lose our battle with the justice system. I think that even after these conferences, these forums, will you allow us to access to courtrooms um, or online access? When you appoint spokespersons to judicial institutions, you've fulfilled your legal duty, your duty under the law, but you haven't actually achieved anything. Spokespersons have a very limited, very restricted mandate in what they can tell the media. It is what we are dealing with are much more serious problems, including that we feel unprotected because we don't have a serious court proceeding that would punish attacks on the media. When we get death threats, how, how do we know how serious they are? We are now in a situation where someone has to get killed practically on their, um, in their home before we get our day in court. So I think we can apportion the blame on both sides. But the media don't have a distinct interest. There is only a public interest. And the justice system has an adversarial and even a hostile attitude towards the media, even though the media are trying to represent the public interest. The judiciary would prefer it, if possible, for the media to stay away from trials. Um, the judges panel is the happiest when there is no one from the media there. There is no camera so that tomorrow on the news or in the newspapers, there is nothing, no news about from the courtroom. And when it comes to the public image, of the justice system and our job, I don't think this is a very constructive way to go about things. Thank you. Before I turn it over to Dr. Relic, that I think are directly related to our previous discussions, I wanted to clarify one thing. It is not just an interest of the public that the media are supposed to represent in a relationship with the justice system. It is also interest of the justice system, interest of the judiciary. It is in our interest to have our decisions conveyed. The other question is, who is a reporter? Mainstream media, fine. But with all due respect, for all of you here, between you and various people claiming press status. There, there is a certain disbalance. And if you are a reporter, do you have an official capacity? If you are, then yes, you, you are eligible for protection, but you also have a responsibility for your conduct. So I don't think it is in the interest of the public to see me on television. It is in the interest of my court for me to convey the decision made by my eight colleagues. That is the interest of my court. It is in the interest of the public to know that They can be informed about the decision. For example, I looked at German media that have accredited reporters for the Constitutional Court. And when the president of the uh, Constitutional uh, Court comes to a studio for an interview or gives an interview for a print medium or an online medium, you have people who are specialized and who discuss uh, the Constitutional Court's decisions. We are an impoverished country in many ways, unfortunately. So this, I think, is 
outside of our reach. I would like to ask Dr. Delius to comment on an interesting question here, but I would like to ask Dr. Delius, Director of the Personal Data Protection Agency. So what Dennis mentioned, these problems in judgments and with personal data, yes. Thank you, President of the Constitutional Court, dear colleagues. I'm glad to be here again at the Judicial Forum. And after 15 speakers, I will try to present some of the positions of the Personal Data Protection Agency and to perhaps answer some questions that have already been posed here for everyone's, I think, benefit. As for the agency itself, you know that we have been applying the law on personal data protection for the past 15 years. We have aligned with the, the EU Directive 9556. And in the past few years, European regulations have been changed. Article 79 of the Stabilization and Association Agreement, Bosnia-Herzegovina took on the obligation that with the coming into force of the agreement, not with joining the EU, that it would align its regulations and its national law with that of the EU. We now have a certain discontinuity because we don't have a new law on data, personal data protection. We haven't ratified the general data protection regulation or the police directive. This is a directive about law and applies to law enforcement in general, so prosecutors' offices and um, the prison system as well, in addition to the police. Now, there are different rules for um, judicial office holders, different rules for reporters. There are obligations, not just for courts, but for all data controllers. My colleagues have spoken about this before, especially the registrar and the presidents of the Supreme Courts and the entities. They already talked about what they've done within their courts. But I can comment on the practice of the High Judicial Prosecutorial Council and the opinions issued by my agency. So I will give you examples. Uh, for example, initially, full text of the indictments and judgments were published on the websites of courts even after the convicts had served their uh, sentences. Now, this kind of data processing we found was against the law because the criminal procedure code did not stipulate for participants in criminal proceedings that data could be processed by websites. There is an instruction by the Council of Ministers about updating a website, you know, somebody is trying to justify their actions. They were simply, but they were, I think, fully aware that the what was being done on the websites was not in line with the law. So we issued this um, opinion at the time and personal data processing is allowed for the purpose of conducting criminal proceedings. We mostly discuss criminal proceedings, I think. In terms of the number of cases, there are more in civil law or administrative law, but I know we all focus more on criminal law. <laughs> it is very important to point out that the Data Protection Agency is the one 
performing oversight over the implementation of this law. We are often requested to provide opinions by courts and other judicial institutions, and we always respond. But there's one important thing to take into account. Any authority applying the law on personal data protection Um, based on the directives that were transposed is considered a data controller. So you are all responsible, not all of you, but anyone who is designated a data controller must ensure personal data protection. Now, there's um, we've heard about how decisions have been anonymized before being published. Um, we can discuss this some more, but the agency has pointed out not just a problem that we heard from um, BHTV, having read information from a judicial institution website, it's not just that you anonymize the accused or the victims, but all the all the witnesses and all the victims who participated in the proceedings. The Data Protection Agency issued an opinion which is aligned uh, with the opinions in the region and in the EU. This was mentioned by the AJPC, so I wanted to go back to it in more detail. So when it comes to prosecutorial and court decisions on crimes against humanity and genocide that have no statute of limitations, the best practice is that of the ICTY. So there can be differences in different courts when it comes to war crimes judgments, but our position is that it is best to follow the practice of the ICTY. When it comes to organized crime and corruption and other offenses of public interest, practice from EU countries, EU member states should be followed. We um, have Slovenia and Croatia, which used to be part of our common state, are now EU members. And when I need to look at somebody's practice from the EU, I look to Croatia and I look to Slovenia. When deciding whether a whether to publish or disclose a decision and uh, what protection, personal data protection um, requirements apply, you must um, assess the public interest. I come from the civil law side of things. So we mostly discussed criminal proceedings here, but you also have a lot of proceedings where that are close to the public. And a large number of uh, um, litigation procedures are decided and the decisions are never published. I think this was mostly for my colleagues from the justice system. As for my colleagues from the media, I wanted to point out a number of issues and regulations. There's a recommendation of the Committee of Ministers to Member States of the Council of Europe about uh, distributing information uh, related to judgments in criminal matters. So Bosnia Herzegovina is a member of the Council of Europe. We have judges at the European Court of uh, Human Rights. I think this recommendation of the Committee of Ministers of the Council of Europe can be used in a number of cases when we want to highlight the obligations 
and the commitments of Bosnia and Herzegovina that need to be upheld. As for the other problems mentioned by representatives of the media, I can say that in view of the data protection law, processing of data for reporting purposes or for media purposes is done according to their codes of conduct or codes of ethics. We've, we have queries weekly, I think, from public figures um, telling us how usually a newspaper or an electronic uh, media outlet has uh, published an article or a story where they feel their rights have been violated. So the processing of personal data for media purposes is conducted in line with your codes of conduct or your codes of ethics. And I think I have probably overstepped my time limit, but I have 30 more seconds. We are expecting a new law in the next two months. Uh, the law has been drafted, all the procedures have been completed. I don't know why it is not being adopted yet. I mean, I don't want to go into it right now. Some of the things I've heard, but I can say that the new law on personal data protection will impose certain obligations that will resolve some of the issues that we've been discussing here, which is privacy policy. I can explain later what that means. And the um, personal data protection officer. I have been working in law for 25 years. I'm the third generation of lawyers in my family. And uh, personal data protection is something I encountered for the first time in 2013. This is not something that we learn in law school. However, we do uh, have an obligation to align our regulations with the data protection requirements. So please take this in, uh, in the best faith. Data controllers, you must have data protection officers. You don't have to employ someone new, but it will facilitate communication between the agency and your institutions, and it will allow you to keep abreast of all of the new regulations in the sector. So, Dr. Relic, I, it's interesting how translation from English, so this is a literal translation of data controller, but it, to, to our ears, it might sound different. If you allow me, there's a comment in the question, Mr. Ljubinko Mitrovic, the Ombudsman of Bosnia-Herzegovina. Let me read his comments. I do apologize if we haven't noted everything. Uh, with gratitude to the organizers, three years ago I was at a similar event in Serbia. It's very similar to what it was. Different views, the truth is in the middle. What should we do? Training and training and education. And the question is, other than Oslobodjenje and independent media, Birni is exactly that. Do other media outlets have uh, persons who are only reporting from the judiciary? Uh, Ms. Kapor and as for BHTV, we have quite a few number of people. We have quite a few people leaving and we are always at the beginning. We have young reporters who train and develop professionally. They reach a level of maturity and because the media in Bosnia Herzegovina is a small pond with lots of crocodiles. They, of course, go to wherever the financial um, conditions are better than here. As for PHTV, I, we can't say that we have reporters who cover only the judiciary. No, we have reporters who will sit in the parliament today. Tomorrow, they'll be attending 
a judgment being delivered in the court of Bosnia and Herzegovina. Of course, we won't send people who only joined us a year or two ago to attend a major case. Of course, we try to make sure that we send more experienced, more mature reporters who know more, but unfortunately, because of the very few journalists, we can't say that we have journalists who only report about and from the judiciary. Yes, we have similar problems through our budget. We cannot secure proper support, but let's be open. What the Constitutional Court can do and what the Court of Bosnia Herzegovina can do, they in fact don't reveal their donor funds. But Supreme Courts of the entities cannot do it, let alone lower level courts in the country. Although we all have the same problem of human resources, although I think that even that can be overcome if there's goodwill and if we don't think, well, we're not the enemies, as Dennis said. I still don't think we're the enemies. I, as the moderator, am coming to a close. I would like to invite Ms. Brightwaite and Mr. Tadic to move here. The two of them will, together with you, they will moderate a set of conclusions from today's meeting, and I thank you for your attention. We're coming to the end of today's judicial forum. So, Ms. Brathwaite and I tried to draw conclusions without um, any ambition to say that this is the best, most comprehensive. The two of us will, of course, present this to you with a kind request. Please bear with us and our mistakes and with a kind request to give us time to specify everything and to prepare the text before the publication of this set of conclusions at a later stage. I'll give you some of the conclusions and um, Biljana will do the rest. I think that we can all agree at today's forum that we all agree that transparency of the work of judicial institutions and generally transparency of public governance is the foundation of modern democracy. The judiciary in Bosnia and Herzegovina doesn't have common standards when it comes to public communication. We are therefore inviting the High Judicial Prosecutorial Council to harmonize uh, the approach to public communication through a common communication strategy that all the courts can follow. We've heard then it's about the differences. Number three, revise the existing guidelines for the publication of court documents and official web pages and adopt guidelines that will be binding for all. Four, consider the possibility of online coverage, live streaming of uh, court cases. We need to look at the technical requirements so that we don't get stuck on the very first obstacle with technical or other problems. Financial, yes, but still this is no excuse. We really should continue working towards solutions. Develop relations with the media, more press conferences, timely publication of information on the web page and elsewhere, organize training and training materials such as guides and video content for media and the journalists so that they can better understand the work of the courts, the differences I mentioned between courts of ordinary jurisdiction and constitutional courts, 
uh, decision-making procedures, differences in the work, and insistence, as we heard, between the courts and the prosecutor's offices. We're talking about courts primarily today. That's the judicial branch of governance. The prosecutor's offices will see with Ms. Brathwaite whether we should organize something in relation to that, because it's a separate topic altogether, as I've said earlier. And I was in the prosecutor's office for a long time. The court is the court. It's the judicial branch of government. A prosecutor is a party to the proceedings. Many countries insist that the prosecutor is a state body, just like the lawyer is a party to the proceedings. They, of course, have their own legal powers and procedures. They can exercise, but we must insist on the judiciary and the judicial competence and the role of the judicial system because it all ends up in the court so a judgment is of the court Ms. Brathwaite I'd like to ask you to take the floor now microphone please microphone please microphone please the interpreter cannot hear microphone please microphone please Microphone, please. There's a single press office for all the courts. Any request for an interview with any judge, it goes to the central body. If the judge receives that, they need to forward it. There needs to be a series of approvals for the interview to be approved. It often isn't. But they are the ones to whom such requests are sent. So the question is, is it realistic to expect every court to be able to develop its own functions with uh, resources that won't really grow much to build all these capacities? Or should we perhaps think about a system where at least courts of first instance would be covered from one place? Maybe we can look at other models. We've also talked to a judge from the Netherlands. They have a one judge in each court who undergoes training as a press judge, you need to opt for a model to know whom to train, to establish a searchable, easily accessible database of court rulings to be published in a timely fashion. And it seems to me that first, the steps by uh, HACP, the database for court documents, and then what we will try with this uh, um, key as elements of decisions. If those decisions are anonymized, there is really no need, no reason not to make it searchable. If that's a database where there are thousands of court rulings, it's difficult to find what you need. It will be difficult for judges to search, let alone somebody who is not even from the profession. So it's really important to have a good, well-organized database. Design uh, training programs for different groups in the public, primary and secondary school students, university students to explain the work, the role and the importance of courts in compliance with the capacities of the institution. Let me also add law schools, of course, in particular, because I saw research from Serbia, I believe it's very similar here, where a judge is inviting law school students uh, for students to become judges it comes eight in the wish list of the students they want to be uh, managers etc they don't really want to be judges it's not good for the judiciary if the best students don't want to be judges of course it's a generational thing it will engender consequences at a later stage but what mr knezhovic said law schools are not interested Maybe we should try to take certain steps for judges to really go there. I know when I was a student a long time ago, we never saw a judge. Now things are a bit different, but there's more room to work with them, with secondary schools, to consider guidelines for public statements by judges and prosecutors, including the use of social networks. I know the British example, they're quite rigorous in that. The court itself is open and the official communication of the court is very open, but just as much. They even have magistrates. 
the part-time judges, basically. But even if within that they need to give a statement, again, they need to have approval as magistrates and it shouldn't be linked to the judicial office at all. So we need to draw a line between that opening of the courts and professional communication and the possibility for each judge to answer questions, which may be counterproductive for the reputation of the judiciary. And finally, what you proposed, monitoring of the communication between media and the courts, because if we really look into this, that we will see whether it gives us results or not what we need to focus on. So these are our informal conclusions. These are our takeaway from this discussion so that perhaps we could invite you to give your comments or add if you have something and to bring today to a close. If I can add one thing, because I discussed this with Mr. Knezevic before the beginning of the forum, an important thing that perhaps can be done in the Constitutional Court, all the rulings of the Constitutional Court that come to the media, we have to call law school professors to explain them to us. No matter how much you know the subject matter, we don't understand it. Last, it was regarding masks in the Sarajevo canton. We saw the media misinterpret that ruling altogether. It didn't mean no more masks. And the statement was such that most media understood it as no more masks. So it's not just about ascending what you understand to the media. To us, it creates an additional burden to convey it properly to the public. So I think that it's a tiny effort for the Constitutional Court to clarify it so that the public understand it. We now have to take those statements and interpret them and explain them to see whom we can call to explain. And then some people say, well, I need to see it and then I'll explain it, etc. That takes time. So you basically ruin a statement by the time you reach the end of this process. It's not just about sending a statement to the media. It's simply not enough, not only for the Constitutional Court, but for any ruling, as if, well, at least that's my impression, as if the idea is to understand as little as possible. Maybe the media will give up if they don't understand. Maybe the serious media won't venture into something they don't really understand. So maybe it's better to send it this way. Maybe the media will just ignore it. It needs to be more accessible to the public. Another recommendation, I do agree with this. My proposal is also to insist with the High Judicial Prosecutorial Council when appointing senior staff that public plans are presented when there are three candidates. This is just a formality, but it's important for the public in the work we do. They need to present their work plan for transparency, communication and public relations. That's what we don't see at the moment, and I think this reflects on managers having no sense of obligation to communicate. I think that if we insisted on that, that to some extent it would improve things. Just a remark, I generally agree with what my colleagues have said, but I just wanted to focus on this transparency issue, and I certainly think that what they talked about, there are much bigger problems. We all agree on this. I do agree with you, and this is a good proposal, and I do agree. That's what President Antonic said, to be accommodating. There are restrictions. Only mainstream media will have the capacity to engage a legal expert, and even that expert will have challenges, others won't. So the court must work with that. We have these circumstances. This is an important ruling that was important at the time. So I think that it's a good thing for the Constitutional Court and for other courts, but again, some courts will have the capacity to do it, some won't. And that's why perhaps we need to think about this, but not all the rulings will have these kind of implications as important. I think that what you're saying 
is not true. The media will not give up, but they'll just convey as they understand it, which is damaging. So, this room in that, there's a bigger problem. The title sounds better when you say masks are unconstitutional. That's also the thing. We're speaking about different media outlets, but since I have the floor, my proposal is uh, Mr. Tadic and I talked about this. I think the idea of visiting Bosnia Herzegovina is good. If the Constitutional Court has this possibility, why not use it? Because not all the journalists are in Sarajevo, and it's not nice. I have a problem with that. I'm the only one from Banja Luka here today. Why wouldn't a forum like this happen in Banja Luka? Why wouldn't a constitutional court sit in Priedor? Why wouldn't our colleagues who work in the local media, and there are quite a few, have an opportunity to become engaged? Maybe that will lead to specialization. Thank you. Let me go back to what was said during the forum by Mr. Knezhevic. The higher the court, the more abstract the decision the more difficult it is to understand. You have to know that the Constitutional Court has its standards not only here, but anywhere in the world, and we need to uphold those standards. I think that what you meant were our press statements. So these are very limited statements, of course, it's not enough. This is what we can work on, but that's why it's important to look at the entire decision, that the entire text is accessible. We publish everything on the web page. But there is a procedure they have to go through. When a ruling is adopted, it takes 30 days for it to leave the court. It needs to go through editorial interventions, then proofreading with this uh, three language version plus English, and only then can it be accessible to the public on the web page. Those are serious problems that we have. However, I do agree, and I hope that we all agree that all of us in this field think that with these statements that we make after, even during the session, if it takes two or three days, when it's a plenary, to keep the public informed about what we're talking about and what we're deciding on. That because our time slots and our style are, yes, difficult and abstract. There's a rule after a decision. No one has the right to elaborate anything. It's the position of the court and not my position. But these are statements that we can work on. I think we can accept these suggestions for the conclusions and that we can. I don't know if you mentioned this when you said visiting judges visiting law schools, journalism students as well, students who are going to be journalists when they graduate so they can learn about the judicial system. Also, perhaps a suggestion, because I guess this is directed at judicial institutions and the international community. There's a lot of grants with the media for reporting on the environment, marginalized groups, maybe even think about the media to receive support through educational activities, but also financial incentives to report on the judiciary adequately. We know you support the media, the media are facing serious difficulties, but also they go through some kind of training, so perhaps Media reporting is daily, reporters don't have, simply don't have the time to 
devote themselves to a particular story for a longer period of time. So I think maybe grants or something could in fact motivize, support the journalists in providing better quality reporting. If we have no other suggestions, we can bring this to a close. On behalf of the Constitutional Court and all of us, first of all, let me thank the United Kingdom and Mrs. Brathwaite, who is heading the Air Center, helping us meet like this for years and years. I think this is very good. We saw and heard the other side. It's not just the judiciary, but now we include the media who are trying to explain how they see things, which is important for us. Let me also give a comment on what uh, Vildana has just mentioned. I think that we can, and the Constitutional Court did used to do this. We don't depend on the parties. We don't have parties that we hear unless we have a public hearing, and that doesn't really happen very often. And because of the COVID restrictions, we haven't had them, but we can move our sessions to different locations and thus bring our work closer to the country, talking to the legal community in Banyaluka, Bihać, Priedor, talk to the professional community, to the citizens, including the media, particularly the local media, thus bring our work closer to the public. Mrs. Brightwaite, I hope that we'll be able to organize our next forum with a full room and with lots of comments and presentations that will be to the benefit of all of us in this country. Thank you once again for the support that you have been providing us. I don't know if you'd like to add anything. I just want to thank you, the Constitutional Court, Mr. Knezer is the president, all the panelists in this panel and in the earlier ones, presidents of the highest courts in the country, the UK embassy and the UK government. We have a list of activities for the next few years. Of course, we'll have to choose and see what we can help with, but I think some of this will be to share experiences from this gathering, and I'm sure there'll be other organizations who will be interested in becoming engaged with whom we can cooperate. I think that we should also thank in particular our virtual participants I think we have more than 60 still, and we hope that the next forum will have everybody in this room. So with this, I'm closing the judicial forum. And I think we have lunch now, yes. <laughs>